Um, sorry, I was muted. Um, um, uh, my name's Brandon Crookshank. Um, I'm a member of the Transportation Commission, obviously. Um, I am a chemistry professor and department chair. I have at no Andrew. idea. Check your email. Oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Keep, please keep going, Crookshank. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just something interrupted. Um, I'm a chemistry professor and department chair at NAU for my full time job, and I guess that's about it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Denardi, I don't think I see you online. If you're here, please let us know. Um, Commissioner Eckhoff. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be here. New Commissioner uh, Matt Eckhoff. Um, Resident of Flagstaff this round about six years and about six years prior, so 12 years total. Excited to join the commission. Uh, my day job, I'm a public health uh, consultant. I run a small business that supports a variety of nonprofits, uh, fund development and program development related to public health practice. Um, and a father of four and uh, a proud Flagstaff resident. Happy to be here and uh, provide input and support for the commission. Thank you. Welcome. We are happy to have you. Uh, Thank you. Koenig. Hi, um, Joe Koenig here. Um, my day job, I develop materials for medical devices, and I'm happy to be on the commission. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mazza. Hi, good afternoon. Erica Mazza, and I am a local Flagstaff resident of going on almost 18 years. And I uh, work with Genterra Enterprises and also to uh, provide grant support to communities in the country. Thank you and welcome also. Uh, we have a couple non-voting commission members, our uh, city traffic engineer. Jeff, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jeff Bauman and my day job is a city traffic engineer in the city of Flagstaff. Uh, and Lieutenant Turley, are you here? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, my name is Ryan Turley. I'm a lieutenant with the Flex uh, Police Department. Been here 16 years. Um, went all through the ranks of the police department till where I'm here now. Great. Thank you for being here. And then I did uh, just want to pause a moment because I see that our new city engineer is here. Uh, Paul Mood, would you like to say hi to the commission? Good afternoon. My name is Paul Mood. I'm the uh, new city engineer. I've been here about one month and it's a pleasure to meet everybody. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to preliminary general business. Uh, the first item we have today is the approval of minutes. Uh, and I will acknowledge there are a lot of minutes in front of us today. And I believe, oh, sorry. One, back one, we're going back one. We're back on uh call to order <laughs> or present commissioners did you do public comment oh no thank you i missed that thank you where is that uh great okay so preliminary general business public comment thank you mr bauman uh so at this time any member of the public may address the commission on any uh subject within the commission's jurisdiction that is not on the meeting's agenda the Arizona open meeting law prohibits the commission from discussing or taking action on an item that is not listed on the prepared agenda. Commissioners may, however, respond to criticism made by those addressing the commission, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be placed on a future agenda. So um, at this time, is there anyone who would like to um, bring an item forward to the commission? Member yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Morley and Commissioners. This is uh, Council Member Shimoni for a couple more days and then just Adam after that. But I uh, just wanted to welcome all the new commissioners and thank you all for your service. Uh, this is one of my favorite commissions to be a part of and, and witness and support. And I plan to continue that uh, for many years to come, hopefully, but we'll see. But just wanted to welcome you all to today's meeting and thank you all for your service and stepping up and looking forward to the good and challenging work ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Council Member. Um, all right, 
So now moving on to the approval of the minutes. There are a lot of minutes in the packet with us, and I think I'm probably the only commissioner that was present for any of those meetings at this point. Maybe a couple with uh, Commissioner Koenig over here. Uh, so with that, we did send to you the Roberts Rules of Order so that you could see that you could feel comfortable voting on the approval of minutes tonight. I will say I have read the minutes uh, and found them to be accurate. Um, but I will pause and see if any commissioners have any questions or corrections or comments on any of the uh, minutes that are in front of you. Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and make a motion to approve the minutes of February 2nd, 2022, March 2nd, 2022, June 1st, 2022, August 3rd, 2022, September 7th, 2022 and November 2nd, 2022. Is there a second? All second. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All, um, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. And I do want to pause and say thank you to Dee for all her hard work getting us caught up. And I'm sure there's probably more to come of these, yes, <laughs> um, but we very much appreciate getting the written record out so that it's easy for people to follow, so thank you. Um, all right, moving on to new business. The next item is the non-standard artistic crosswalk policy. So it's for Reed, all right, thank you, Dean. Reed's gonna jump into this one, but while he's getting set up, I can give you a little bit of an introduction, though I think it's pretty well spelled out in the agenda. Uh, we were asked to put together or take a look at the possibility of non-standard artistic crosswalks as part of a fair item for city council. Fairs are those future agenda item requests. It's tentatively scheduled for a work session in February with city council. So we'll talk about this tonight, probably talk about it again at our February meeting to kind of wrap things up before we go to city council. There's still some internal review, potentially even the beautification and public art commission wants to take a look at this as well. So. You're getting the first look at it tonight. With that, I'll give it to Reed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Traffic Commission. My name is Reed Miller. I'm the senior transportation engineer for the city of Flagstaff. Uh, as Jeff just mentioned, I'm going to be going over the draft policy for non standard artistic crosswalks. Uh, it's my understanding that you received the policy in your via email last Friday. And so I put together a PowerPoint that will help us walk through the policy and open it up for discussion. So let's get started. Uh, just as a matter of background, the non-standard artistic crosswalks incorporate designs of multicolored treatments between the existing white lines of a marked crosswalk, an existing marked crosswalk. The city has received requests to add artistic features to existing crosswalks over the past several years, we'll say. The requests, however, do not conform to the standard that we abide to by, which is the Federal Highway Administration's manual on uniform traffic control devices, which is recognized as the na national standard for traffic control. According to FHWA, crosswalk treatments should be subdued colored treatments between the legally marked transverse crosswalk lines that are devoid of retro reflective properties and do not diminish the effectiveness of the legally required transverse uh, pavement markings used to establish a crosswalk. On the right of this slide, I'm showing at the bottom right uh, a crosswalk that you may recognize from Aspen Street across from Heritage Square. This would adhere to FHWA's requirements. The one on the top slide um, is what we're proposing to now allow in certain instances and in certain applications in Flagstaff. So the purpose of this policy is to allow the installation of non-standard crosswalks while providing requirements for its design and maintenance that do not compromise safety. Several cities have created policies around the country allowing businesses, organizations, and communities the ability to request non-standard artistic crosswalks 
examples of cities that we looked into, include Inglewood, Colorado, Salinas, California, Tempe, Arizona, and the city of Phoenix. And in fact, we like the city of Phoenix policies so well, we kind of uh, used it as our template to create our own. So the locations that we're considering, and this is spelled out in the policy, crosswalk must be at a location where there is an existing marked crosswalk and where a vehicle is already required to stop, either due to a traffic signal, a pedestrian hybrid beacon, a PHB, or a stop sign. Further, it should be the location should be on a street that has lower traffic volumes, widths of no more than three lanes, and speed limits of 25 miles per hour. Also, where the pavement is in good condition with 100 feet of each in each direction, and where there are no programmed pavement preservation projects within the next two years. Uh, over on the right, we've put together a couple of examples of crosswalks. The one on the bottom called Piano Keys is what the city of Flagstaff uses as our standard. Um, also commonly used not in, within the city limits, but they're not on city streets are the parallel lines. ADOT uses that as their standard. However, I do wanna point out that this policy is not proposed to apply to ADOT streets. The crosswalk must also be in a location where an existing high visibility crosswalk cannot, or I'm sorry, an existing high visibility crosswalk cannot be converted to a standard crosswalk shall meet the city of Flagstaff standards. Read, yes. excuse me, can you explain that last bullet point that you just went over? Sure. So, let's see. Again, this piano key type is what the city of Flagstaff uses as our standard. Um, and ADOT uses these parallel lines. And what we're saying here in that, that last bullet is we can't take one of our existing crosswalk markings and convert it to this type. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. By the way, if anybody has questions throughout this, please interrupt me. Um, I have a question. Is the point of clarity, um, how does the painting of the square at LaRue and Aspen that happened a couple of years ago, how would that fall in with these regulations? Um, I was not invite, <laughs> involved in the approval process of that, so perhaps Jeff Bauman, our traffic engineer, can tell you. Yes, yeah, so that was certainly a one-off that was met with very mixed results. Um, it was intentionally done with paint so that it wouldn't last very long. Um, it was not in any of the crosswalks, so it also kind of avoided the crosswalk issue. One, it was a one-off. It wasn't met with a lot of enthusiasm. We've never even talked about doing one of those again. So this policy is, is um, covering crosswalks only, not not any other kinds of pavement paint. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, which are generally not, yeah. So the next slide goes over what we're proposing for our application process. The city will receive or re will review the proposed design and perform a field review of the proposed locations. Once the proposed design is conditionally approved, by the city, the applicant will be notified. The application, mu the applicant must submit a final design on a scaled plan drawing with dimensions and identify the existing pavement type. And the final design plan and material specifications will be submitted to, to and receive pre-approval by the city, city traffic engineer and the city beautification manager. And the applicant shall hire a qualified contractor to obtain the required permits and prefer, perform the installation per city engineering standards for pavement markings. Um, 
can anybody apply for any marking on any street or do they have to have a residential or business address nearby? Uh, we haven't talked about that. You're talking about somebody that is not a resident of Flagstaff? Um, not necessarily a resident. I guess, can any resident apply for any crossing or is this intended for local businesses or resident to, in their own neighborhood? I don't know that we have, we, we certainly haven't discussed that. I don't know that we would prohibit that or I don't know why not. Yeah. I'll follow up with that because I had a similar question. It seems to go in line with kind of the offsite sign permitting. Um, if a business wants to display an ad for themselves or, you know, I'm not, is it, is it just artwork or is it, are we getting into you know, determining you know, proper language and, um, you know, I'm thinking of the one in, in DC that, you know, they painted Black Lives Matter all the way down the street, right? So well, are we looking at it just from an art perspective? Um, let's see, non, yeah, I guess, yeah. We do address that later on in, in another slide. So I think it'll answer your question. Let me know if it doesn't. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Now we're getting into the design requirements. The design shall not infringe upon the existing crosswalk markings or mimic official pavement markings or traffic control devices to cause confusion. Shall not include words, logos, advertising, insensitive images, or three-dimensional designs. So does that answer your question there perhaps, Eric? I believe it answers my portion of the question, Commissioner. Is, is that in line with what you're going? Because I don't want to. I don't want to step on your question with my follow-up question if it was not too gentle. Um, no, I think I think they answered my question. It said that you know there was some consideration at this point in time that uh, if there's any sort of whoever makes the application resides nearby to what the where the application would be. I didn't quite hear what you were saying. Sorry. Um, I think that you answered my question by saying that uh, whoever the applicant uh, does not have to reside nearby where the intended crosswalk markings would be. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think we would have an issue with that. Um, the design shall be within the gaps of the existing markings. If more than one crosswalk at an intersection is being considered, shall have a consistent style to create a unified aesthetic. It shall also include a two inch black margin or border between the crosswalk markings and any design elements. And it shall be approved in addition by the traffic engineer, it shall be approved by the beautification manager. At the approved crosswalk location, the city will add 12 inch parallel markings and refresh the existing crosswalk markings if needed. So this, this drawing to the right shows these 12 inch mar uh, parallel markings at the top, kind of so that it, uh, it will give a border that our current crosswalk markings do not have. You can also see in this drawing how the two inch black borders are to be laid out. The design material shall consist of preformed thermoplastic. The material shall provide a non-slip surface for pedestrians and be non-retroreflective. So our crosswalk markings are retroreflective and we don't want these to be in conflict with that. On to the costs. All costs associated with the installation of the crosswalk will be the responsibility of the applicant, including permit fees and temporary traffic control. And as far as maintenance goes, the city shall be responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the existing high visibility crosswalk and the 12 inch parallel lines. 
well <clears throat> and the applicant I'm sorry will notify the applicant when maintenance is needed this includes fading or chipping sections and the applicant shall be responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the artistic crosswalk portions due to normal wear resurfacing and or snow removal the applicant shall also be responsible for restoring the crosswalk to its original condition if they decide they no longer wish to maintain the artistic crosswalk So that's the end of my presentation on the policy. Any questions or discussion items? Thank you, Reed. We will do questions from the commission and then um, ask if there's any public comment and move on to comments and direction. And this is not an action item. They're seeking feedback tonight uh, with the expectation that it would come back to us again, correct? Uh, so any questions from the commission? Madam Chair, thank you. Um, clarification, I, I think, um, Mr. Bowman, I, I heard you say this, but one of the items that upon review, it appears that the MUTCD that you, that was cited, um, has very strong delineations about the crosswalk, but the inside of the crosswalk, like at LaRue and Aspen, um, inside the box painting, if you will, that is not, it, it, that is not part of their purview. And so, and so I just wanna be sure that it is just the crosswalks and it's not the interior, which seems like, you know, that has, that leaves a little bit more for interpretation, one part of the question. And then the other part of the question is, have you, has there been any research done on cease and desist because of USDOT taking a stand that there's really no support for murals within the crosswalk? So the MUTCD guidance talks about subdued patterns, which is I think the LaRue and Aspen that being acceptable. Um, so that's kind of a standard issue MUTCD response and then there's supplemental guidance that they've also put out for a memo. However, we, we were asked to go ahead and figure out a way to make this happen outside of those guidelines. Um, and so we looked around at other communities and this is kind of the pattern that we're seeing other communities take. I haven't seen any information about cease and desist or you're not eligible for grants anymore or any of that kind of business on this front. Um, the activity I've seen is probably going more towards the direction that we're proposing is what I'm seeing from or a couple handfuls of communities. Thank you, that's helpful. Other questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Thomas. Uh, just one more quali or, yeah, clarifying question. The picture of the crosswalk uh, across Aspen in the center of the street there, um, I'm a, my understanding of this is that wouldn't be eligible for one of these because there's no traffic control device that would cause it to stop at that location. Yes, Commissioner Koenig, it would not have, in that it's not a qualified location uh, and it's a mid-block crossing. It's our policy is going to disallow crosswalks in locations other than where cars are already to stop or already required to stop. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Um, I just, I think I heard um, Mr. Bauman say, and I think you were saying too, Reed, while the MUTCD talks about it being very subdued, this policy is expanding that. We are allowing the bright colors that you're showing on the slides, right? Yes, that's what we are doing, putting together a policy that will allow something outside of those Perfect. guidelines. Uh, but we're also uh, requiring them in, in locations that we think will be still considered safe. Great. Um, all right, well, seeing no other, oh, I do have a question from uh, Council Member Shimoni. Yes, uh, is it appropriate to ask my question now? Yes, I was about to open it up to the public anyway. Perfect, um, thank you for the presentation and I just have a couple of comments and questions to, to ask and I guess for the commission to consider. Um, 
Jeff, can you can someone speak more to <clears throat> excuse me why the crosswalk downtown on Aspen is is so uh, so that, I guess not viewed as a good design. I understand that it doesn't qualify in the sense of it being mid block or a car stopped, but uh, is there other reasons why we we don't like that design? Thank you. No, there's nothing wrong with the Aspen and the Aspen mid block crossing. It's perfectly acceptable. We could do it a bunch more times and does meet the METC guidance. OK, but but did you say that staff wasn't in favor of doing more of those? No, no, that's not. Oh, not what we said, I don't think. OK, I must have misheard something. That's OK. And then Jeff, my other question is in regards to the Fremont right sizing effort that we're like the Transportation Commission's considering or, in, or looking into with staff, of course. Um, Knowing that we're right sizing it from like I think five lanes to three lanes, uh, would that qualify? But I think I know the answer because it's not an area where cars are stopped. So, other than like the cars being stopped, is there another reason why that wouldn't qualify? What was the location? Council member. Oh, so Fremont right sizing. Just to make sure we stay on this agenda item and not the future agenda item, you're specifically talking about whether or not. The proposal for a crossing across Fremont with a crosswalk could be an artistic crosswalk. Yes, correct. I'm just wondering if that would qualify or if that would, or I'm just trying to take what, you know, we're hearing and put it into practice and see, you know, what this really means for some of these projects. So the existing crossing on Fremont at the park would qualify uh -huh. for the treatment that we did on Aspen Avenue mid block between LaRue and San Francisco. But okay, not, wonder. Okay. Sorry, but not but not what? But would but you're correct, it would not fall into the policy that we're talking about right now with this agenda item with the artistic right. Person. It doesn't meet the MUTCD subdued brick pattern or similar. Okay, so I, I do wonder if there's a way to adjust the policy we're looking at to to allow for such types of projects, commissioners. And then um, um, lastly, I'll just share that, you know, I, I, I just want to raise a question about the two year um, timeline in terms of from like uh, doing repavement or or work on a road. I wonder if that's going to um, be something we, we regret in terms of creating a limiting factor. Um, and then uh, I'm just glad to see that, you know, a lot of the designs or the ideas behind the designs in terms of being like 25 miles an hour and whatnot seem to be aligned with our vision zero plans at the city. So uh, that's that's really exciting. But that's that's all I had. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, staff. Thank you, council member. Um, are there other members of the public who wish to comment on this agenda item tonight? If you're online, you can put a Q or C in the chat and I will look for that. All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and move it on to um, commissioner discussion. So looking for any feedback to staff about how um, changes or support for the policy. Um, commissioner Koenig. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that presentation, Reed. Um, my one concern I have is, uh, or one idea I have would be to re ask for upfront removal costs. Um, somebody could apply for one of these and pay to put it in and then move out of town, and then the city is left holding the bag to get rid of it. Um, so I know, yeah, some, something that might be able to ensure they get removed um, if they're no longer attractive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the other comments from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Cohen. Um, so I guess my, my other question, uh, personally, I guess I don't really like the idea of painting inside the crosswalks. And so is there an option for our commission to decline to support this? Or what kind of feedback are you looking for from us? Um, I. I'm not sure quite how to handle that, but I think just your feedback alone, um, I, that, that does get passed on to the city council, which 
uh, this is going to the city council in February. So I think just that vote, we'll call it, um, gets passed on to them, am I correct? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Koenig, the, I think the commission could choose to recommend to city council that they don't pursue this, but Jeff, this did come as a request of city council, right? It, it did come as a request from city council to kind of figure out a way to make this happen. But yeah, I mean, the recommendation could be, we don't think it's a good idea if the, that was the wish of the whole commission. I did just take a peek while I have the mic button. It's February 28th is the work session right now. So we have some time again in February to talk about it and make some adjustments. So. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Mike. Thank you again, Chair. Um, then I think on that point, um, I guess I'm, I'm still a little bit challenged as to why the crosswalks themselves, um, because they are so regulated and you know, there's, and the art that goes within the crosswalks is not as regulated. And so I'm not exactly sure why we are choosing one that is more regulated and I will work to try to find that, uh, the, those sites where some of those communities did receive cease and desist orders from USDOT. Um, regarding the the cross regarding painting within the crosswalk itself, um, so I am a bit concerned that if this is such a you know, USDOT takes a stance on this particular thing, you know, just why we're trying to go in this route, and if there's other options that might be you know less um, of a potential safety issue down the road. Uh, Commissioner Eckhoff. Thank you. I think to follow up on Commissioner Maza's, you know, comments, you know, brief review uh, through the DOT policy seemed to um, allude to the fact that there wasn't a, a great risk to safety um, as these types of crosswalks were studied. I'm curious if, if Jeff or Reed or, or city staff has an opinion professionally on that topic. Are you talking about the FHWA memo that was put out? I believe so. I think in, in reviewing the agenda items for today, and I was trying to see if there would be a reason that we as a commission should, you know, put the brakes on a topic like this to look at safety issues. And I, I did not see any, but I would like to be educated if there are any from your perspective. Well, I do recall in that memo that it talked about it did not increase safety to have uh, marked, cro I mean, uh, artistic crosswalks. I don't recall that it said that it did not decrease, but I, I'll take another look at it. And Thank you, I appreciate that. And I just add on from our perspective, um, the reason that we're recommending, I think other communities are recommending that these only be placed adjacent to traffic control devices where vehicles are already stopping is to minimize that risk of the crosswalk being less effective. And a mid-block location, you're relying a lot on those markings on the street and if you kind of hidden them or blended them in with art, there's, I think, a decent potential depending on the design and that it would be minimized, the safety would be minimized. And of course, we don't have the resources to like do a simulator test on every artistic design to see if it would be good or bad in that environment. So we've tried to minimize that risk by saying it's only at stop control locations and otherwise. But to continue the thought on what F F FHWA did say, they they made a ruling on what is acceptable and what we're proposing is just a little bit outside those guidelines. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners? No, commissioner? Yeah, so I guess, you know, personally my thought is that um, Flagstaff has a lot of different opportunities for artwork. There's a lot of murals. Uh, there's opportunities to um, paint utility boxes or to apply decorative covers to utility boxes, which all seem to be great. Uh, but I don't think this makes sense to put decorative markings in the roadway that will require upkeep, they will degrade, they will get into our water supply. And um, while it has not been shown to be worse, uh, valuing pedestrian and bicycle safety doesn't seem like it makes sense to take that risk either. Thank you. Um. All right, I'll provide some comments and then we'll see if uh, we'll, we'll see if staff needs any more direction or that's good. Um, 
I first just want to thank staff for researching it. And I think that, um, you know, trying to find these wins for council where they want to see things move forward is important. And um, so, you know, respect, definitely respect your comments, Commissioner, but um, definitely want to support council and their efforts to see these things through. And I think I'm maybe aligned with Commissioner Eckhoff and that I didn't see anything that said there was a detriment to safety, just not an enhanced opportunity for safety maybe. And I did do a little bit of research into what the latest is because the memo I think was from 2013. So with DOT, what's happening now? And I was, I'm actually under the impression that they're looking at updating these documents and a lot of the comments that they're receiving may be on expanding the artistic possibility of crosswalks. So I will, it will be interesting to see what happens with that over the coming year and how that aligns with um, what we're proposing. Um, the couple, you know, specific comments I thought for consideration were you were very clear on the existing crosswalks only, um, but I think you're both familiar that at the Downtown Connection Center, there's been some proposals for potentially artistic crosswalks on Phoenix Avenue. I think, I understand that you don't wanna get into a new warrants process, but if there are planned crosswalks as they're installed, they may not be existing, um, but maybe are an opportunity for whatever art policy we would have associated with them. Um, I also, uh, I guess I was, a, I was a little confused about the piano keys of, um, so the piano keys are considered high visibility and our policy would only apply to City of Flagstaff crosswalks and not the single striping crosswalks that ADOT does, but we would only allow, we wouldn't allow the conversion or removal of piano keys. And so I guess I'm, and then again, only an existing crosswalk. So I'm like, is this allowed anywhere <laughs> under that scenario? Uh, <laughs> yes, it would be. It's just that you would, they would work within the existing crosswalk, whether it's a piano key or not. But, if, but, but we thought, wouldn't be converting piano keys to a, uh, a crosswalk marking that's contrary to City of Flagstaff standards. So this could be done within a piano key, a high visibility piano key crosswalk could become a artistic piano key crosswalk. It just could, okay, I thought maybe we were like downgrading the high visibility by adding the art and <laughs> got it. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I think I've, Maybe to some of um, Commissioner uh, Maz's points that um, like it, they were very confined within the crosswalk is there opportunity for art to expand beyond it. I think that that's some things that you're seeing as well. Um, and then there were some pieces about cost, like it can only be three lanes. Um, and I, I guess I go back to the, like 20, it, there were limitations to how big the art could be, I think, and essentially the policy suggested it was tied to cost. But if well, it, well, I, that was kind of a confusion. I should probably okay. should have modified that. The, the limitation of the three lanes didn't, it wasn't there so that we would reduce cost. It was just pointing out that with the three lanes, it would not be as expensive. Got it. My, yeah, my point was, well, if we're not paying for it, do we care what someone else spends on no. it? <laughs> and um, I, I should probably take that okay. over there. Um, and then finally, I think that the approval of the Beautification Commission is really important, or not necessarily the commission, but the manager or the commission is really important because I don't want transportation to be in the middle of whether or not that was a good art design and those um, political pieces and whether it's an ad or not an ad. And so I would really say, I think all the design features outside of um, whether or not it's, you know, acceptable from an engineering standard should really be pushed to the approval of the either commission or the manager, whatever um, that team thinks is the appropriate um, level. So those would be my comments on that. Yeah. And I think they would totally be in charge of all of that. It, we would just be checking to make sure it meets our policy. Don't delete that. <laughs> um, any other final questions or comments from any commissioners? All right. Uh, staff, you have the direction you need? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Glad you saw through some conflicting comments there and know where to take it. <laughs> 
Um, all right, so number two is the residential traffic management program update. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for having me tonight. <clears throat> okay, so tonight we're gonna to be talking about the Residential Traffic Management Guide update. My name is David Lemke. I am a Transportation Engineer Associate here at the City of Flagstaff. So we've brought this to you before, and um, tonight we're hoping to go over certain decision points that we would like to have some feedback on so that we can try to finalize this document and um, get it approved. And these decision points include initiation signatures, affected area, transportation commission involvement, neighborhood approval, and annual budget. And I put slides in here for an opportunity to um, uh, talk about each one. Would we want to discuss them at each of those slides or like wait till the end to discuss them or some sort of combination? Great question. I think that some of them are interrelated. So let's go through your presentation. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay, so um, for some background, we've done some research and we've re reviewed residential traffic management guides from seven other municipalities. And these include the city of Scottsdale, Tempe, Peoria, Tucson, Berkeley, Cincinnati, and Seattle. Because one thing we heard from the last time we came was, hey, like, what are other people doing? And is there any way that we could replicate that? Or like, we want to try to make this as fair as possible. Because there's a balance between like um, how much the citizens can do and how much we can do. So um, the first one was required signatures for data collection. And this is just to do a traffic study. It's not to like get something constructed. It's just like the first step. And we found that two out of seven of the municipalities required some sort of signatures for traffic data collection to get the process started. Um, in Scottsdale, they had 10 signatures and they only allowed one signature per property. And in Cincinnati, they need, needed signatures from 50% of residents within the affected area. Um, in Seattle, it was interesting, they required the citizens to fill out an application for funding. That was the first step, so still some sort of initiation. And then in the other four, there was only a phone call or an email to get traffic data collected. And so our recommendation would be uh, five signatures from people near the affected area and only one signature per household accepted with signatures from people 18 years of age or older. And we recommend this because we've had a large increase in recommendations. I believe we have 16 active uh, traffic mitigation projects currently. And um, we're hoping that if we have this initiation, it'll be a sign early on that the neighborhood does want to have uh, traffic calming installed. Because in the past, we found that there might be one or two um, residents who really strongly want transportation calming or traffic calming while the rest of the neighborhood might be um, not as interested. So we're hoping to get good neighborhood feedback from the beginning with these signatures. And uh, feel free to ask any questions anytime. I'm happy to answer them. Um, yes. Um, I guess my one question would be uh, that four out of seven that don't require anything. Uh -huh. um, do they say at all how long it takes them to get around to it? Do they have a big queue or do they not get a lot of requests? Um, that's a good question. It would depend on the municipality. I know one of them, like uh, Berkeley, for example, they required just an email, but they had everyone submit the requests by a certain time, like in January, and it was about a year process to like, collect the data, do all that. So they did have some sort of timeline, some sort of time expectations. Good question. Okay, so now it's uh, determining affected area. This was a big um, issue, or not issue, but big thing we talked about at the last meeting. And this would be the people who would uh, vote on like what kind of traffic calming would be necessary or like if the traffic calming would be constructed. And after reviewing the other municipalities, the most common way for determining affected area was internally by staff, like setting these boundaries. And in some cases with input from the community, um, the size was dependent on the scale of the project. Uh, City of Peoria, which has a very extensive traffic mitigation program, they recommended limiting the size um, from intersection to intersection of the affected area if possible, because it's difficult to achieve consensus with a larger area. Um, here are some examples. This is city of Peoria and they require 70%. Um, they do do a lot of speed humps. That's 
the main traffic calming that they create. And as you can see, they typically limit it to 22 to 35 like possible houses to vote from. And in uh, this example, they'd need 16 of 22, same in the other one, 22 of 32, to get these um, the mitigation installed. Uh, this is another example from Scottsdale's, and theirs is larger. They can they range from one fourth of a mile by three eighths of a mile to three fourths of a mile to one mile. So their areas could potentially be much bigger. But as for Flagstaff, we would recommend limiting this boundary size to a max of 35 households, and that larger impacted areas would be beyond the scope of the RTMG and potentially need like. Um, larger investment or larger uh, solutions than what we could do uh, as a traffic calming, like in a neighborhood basis. All right, so next is Transportation Commission involvement. Um, three out of seven municipalities required at least one public meeting um, for the final project approval. Um, the Transportation Commission of Scottsdale had to approve all traffic calming, calming projects before construction. But that was their only meeting, like at the end they'd meet. They'd show them what they had and they would say yes or no. And so our recommendation would be two public transportation commission meetings. And this is also reflected in that uh, flow chart that I passed out. Um, one to choose a temporary strategy and one to approve the final design. Uh, neighborhood approval. So this would be after we've chosen the boundary, um, deciding, okay, how many people have to be on board to um, construct the trans traffic mitigation. Um, all seven of the municipalities required some form of neighborhood approval, ranging from 50 to 75%. And this is probably the biggest missing piece from our current traffic guide is we didn't have any kind of approval. It was uh, more just hearing from the neighborhoods and um, doing the best we could. And we didn't uh, necessarily reach out to a large group and say, okay, do all of you want this? Do all of you want not want this? And uh, two out of seven of the municipalities also required 100% approval from residents immediately adjacent to the traffic calming installations. So if you were like within 50 feet or like right next to a speed hump, you would have to be on board, otherwise they wouldn't construct it. Um, so our recommendation, we heard that 70% was very high in our last meeting and that was our previous recommendation. So we thought 65% might be a good middle ground between 75 and 50, it's a little bit higher, but we do wanna make sure that we have the neighborhood approval and 100% approval from properties immediately adjacent. Um, and this brings us to our annual budgets. Uh, all of the municipalities, again, had some form of dedicated funds for traffic calming. Uh, City of Peoria had an annual budget of 60,000, Scottsdale 250,000, Berkeley 50,000. And Seattle was really interesting because they had a Your Voice, Your Choice fund. It was like a fund that everyone in the community could vote on and um, then after they voted, they'd go and say, oh, like this crosswalk near the library got the most votes. We'll construct that with this money. So it was, but it was like uh, community wide. So it was a lot of people involved in voting. So our recommendation was 50,000 annual budget. Um, we hope to get at least, uh, depending on what the solution would be, if it's radar feedback signs, we could do multiple of those with this. If it's something larger, maybe two to three um, substantial traffic calming projects on that budget. Um, and final considerations, we recommend traffic calming efforts be limited to residential, commercial, local, and minor collector roads only. We would want to avoid working on higher classification roadways like arterials or major collectors because those have a lot more volume and higher speeds typically. And that is our presentation. Thank you so much and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. And I want to acknowledge that I just recognized that my agenda uh, was out of order and I'm on the wrong number two. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I was you, curious. I was like, I don't remember. Yeah. And you were second. so polite for not correcting me. Yeah. Uh, so for those who are here for other agenda items, we will go back to them after this one. Um, so with that, any questions first from the commission? Great. Oh, yes. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I know that uh, in a past life, this has come up a couple times, and uh, I appreciate the process that is being put in place. Uh, just a real quick question. Um, one of the other communities mentioned property. Um, you had one signature per property. 
Uh, and then it looks like ours says household. So I'm thinking of, you know, an apartment complex, multiplex or something like that. So each unit per se would have an ability for a signature that that would count as part of that 35. That is a really good question. Um, from what I've seen in the other ones, they are usually limited to property owners. And um, as far as apartment complex, I think that's something we'd have to decide if we wanted to do every unit or just whoever owns the apartment complex. Um, I'd have to talk with Jeff and the team to kind of see what makes uh, the most sense because they haven't specifically said what they do when they deal with that situation in the, the guides that I found. At least for apartment complex. They do say with HOAs that they'd reach out to the HOA and they'd have them kind of be the vote like by themselves. And I appreciate that. And I think, you know, just a little bit of follow up there would be helpful. Um, you know, trying to think through some of the places where, you know, it probably doesn't fit with apartment complexes, but, you know, a fourplex, you know, even a duplex that is owned on either side, you know, the con, you know, condominium component. So just I, I would just make sure that that definition is is well defined throughout. But I appreciate the the whole process that you guys are putting in place here. Gotcha, Commissioner Crookshank. Um, thank you, Chair, um, and thanks, David, for your presentation. Um, um, my question, and this came up, I think, at our last meeting, um, was regarding the sixty five percent that you proposed as far as approval. Um, is that 65% of those in the affected area that actually vote? Or is that 65% of all the residents? And if you don't vote, how is that counted? That, that is a great question. That'd be 65% from the boundaries that we created of those max 35 households. Like if it was the max, then there'd be 35, but it could be lower, it could be 10 to 15, depending on the area. And if somebody doesn't vote, then that's a no vote. Uh, correct. Yeah. OK. All right, Commissioner Eckhoff. Thank you. I want to ask a question about that $50,000 annual budget mark. Um, I was hearing a couple of you know automated traffic signs could be a part of that. But it sounds like quite a few traffic calming efforts could, are in the queue here presently. Should that budget amount um, be be reconsidered based on um, what we have in the queue and going forward, or is that kind of what we want to get to for a normalized year? I believe the oh, do you, oh I believe the fifty thousand would be ideal for a normalized year. As far as do, um, addressing the past projects. It would be ideal, I believe, to have a larger budget, but I think for now we were just trying to figure out what the ideal budget would be per year, but um, I'm not sure if we wanted to ask for more. I'll, I can help out a little bit here too. We don't have a dedicated funding source. Um, most mm -hmm. all of our transportation projects are coming from Proposition 419 and it's early in the 20 year program, but it's fairly well defined over 20 years. There's not a lot of flexibility so even I, I think we'll be able to find 50,000 but I'm not sure how we're going to do beyond that I would agree we'd like to have a little bit more money but 50 seem from zero to 50 seems like a good start um, so that's our recommendation but I I would agree we have a backlog that's going to take a while to get through at 50,000 thank you appreciate that any other questions from the commission all right, are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Uh, yes, Ms. Storks. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great, thanks. Um, I guess one thing that I had a question about was um, the piece um, that related to the different classifications of roads and that some types of road classifications could be eligible for traffic calming and others would not because they received too much traffic. Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure about the language on that, but um, just asking um, if there's more traffic in an area, but it's speeding and affecting safety than 
um, why we would leave that out. And again, not wanting to go to another agenda item, but if uh, Fremont, for example, would qualify under this, or if it would be considered like um, a, the classification of a larger road that didn't qualify. Thanks. David, can you speak to Ava's question? Um, yes, I think I can. I might need help from Jeff, but um, I guess the first part is that, um, yes, Fremont is a minor collector, so it would still be part of this process. And um, I've seen other communities have like two separate projects or two separate programs, one for lower level roads, like local residential minor collector, one for higher arterial roads. And a lot of the, all the requests we've gotten have been on minor collectors or below so far. So all, all of our backlogged projects would potentially still be qualified under this new program. We haven't gotten to the point where we've gotten an issue on an arterial or a, a major collector, but if we did get to that point, I assume we wouldn't just let it, um, let it ride. I'm, I'm assuming we try to find some sort of solution. Thank you. Um, Council Member Shimoni. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, David, for your presentation and work on this. Uh, so my comment is really just that, you know, I think that if our roads aren't serving our community well in terms of safety concerns, that's on us, right? The city of Flagstaff. And that's our responsibility to be designing and building roads that result in community feeling safe and comfortable with. And if we're not doing that, then we should invite the concerns and complaints and, and critiques, and we should embrace that and, and learn from them to pr prevent us from making that same mistake moving forward while trying to correct the past. So my comment is really, Chair and, and committee com Commission Member, sorry, that uh, we shouldn't make this a difficult process for the public to be voiced and be heard just for trying to speak up in regards to their safety and comfort. Um, I think this is an us issue and not a them issue, and maybe there should be some level of requirement minimums for them to be heard, but uh, I don't I don't think this needs to be complicated and 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 too strenuous and, and difficult. Um, I think we should be embracing and inviting and not turning away people, making it more complicated. Uh, thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, any other members of the public? All right, with that, we'll move back to commission discussion and I see Commissioner Eckhoff. Thank you. I think just um, concern around those approval or those, you know, the burden of getting signatures of community members for A, investigating an issue and B, um, approval of, of remediation of that issue, 65 and 100 percent. I would agree council member with council member Shimoni. Um, I'm thinking of scenarios that might be, you know, just a few properties. We have a lot of STRs in the community. Are the corporate owned properties going to be as engaged as those who are here every day? Uh, I would certainly like to see that threshold lower, um, especially considering that those issues may arise. Um, 65, 70, 50 percent, I think that's fine to get things started. 100 percent for an approval, I feel like is uh, going to be a burden in several situations. And I would certainly put my voice out there to to, to lower that percentage for that threshold. Thank you. Other commissioners? Commissioner Cronin. Uh, thank you. Yes, and I want to thank the um, uh, uh, traffic engineering staff for bringing this proposal. Um, I think overall it's going to be really great to have a clearer process and it should provide uh, better clarity for the public and hopefully a more efficient process as well. Um, I have a series of comments here. Um, when I was brought up last time, there's still cut through traffic as mentioned in the first sentence of the document. Later on in the document, it says we're not going to deal with cut through traffic. So uh, if we could edit that sentence to remove that, um, that would be great. Um, uh, step three on your process somewhere in the document, it says um, it'll happen at the next Transportation Commission meeting. 
and maybe just add some language there that'll happen in the next available transportation commission meeting or it'll be added to the list of agenda items for the for future transportation commission meetings um on you have a, a series of eight policies uh, policies and policy number eight can you say that it will not uh affect uh traffic patterns and i guess i'm just you know if we're slowing traffic down and traffic wind up going elsewhere um how are we going to judge if it's not affecting traffic patterns and is that a realistic expectation of certain streets that um that it doesn't affect traffic patterns um i think if you look at the plaza vieja traffic circles the goal of that was to affect traffic patterns um specifically so just adding some clarity around that um and i guess and, and then my, i guess my last comment on this is that you know one of the i I, it doesn't feel good having this many requests and it taking a long time to address them and deal with them. And um, and it seems like the biggest challenge we have is that we don't have great tools still in our toolbox um, and building roundabouts takes time and is expensive, especially with limited budget. Um, I would really like to uh, try and consider um, speed bumps, not speed bumps, sorry, speed humps or traffic pillows. Um, uh, they're used in, I know that we've heard in the past that the uh, um, the public works crew has concerns around them, and I don't know if it makes sense to bring them in and have a conversation with them, but some way to start trying them out and figure out what it takes to make them work in our area. I think would something like that would help a lot. Uh, in a lot of these situations, that might be the best solution, or at least a solution that's easy to try and fast to try and might help to move through these a little quicker. Um, in the future. And so as much as getting this process clear is great, I also want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that we need some more solutions and that might be a good solution. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, other commissioners? All right, I had uh, a similar comment, I think, to Commissioner Eckhoff. Um, and this, but I have a specific idea around a resolution for it because I agree. I think we want to make sure that there's some, I think the goal is to make sure there's community buy-in to the project. Um, but I worry about the implementation of that and 70% being high. And, um, I think that would be a, you know, I think survey companies strive to get like 40% responses from people sometimes. And I just worry about the complicated nature disputes over, you know, is it an apartment complex? Is it a um, uh, property owner? Is it the renter living in the house? Just so many questions around that. Um, my suggestion is that we increase the threshold on step one to even get the process started and get staff engaged on it so that a higher number than five need to have interest in exploring. And I think that that also respects staff time so that way you know, you and a couple buddies can't get together and um, send uh, transportation staff on a two-year quest to find <laughs> a traffic calming measure that works for you. Um, but then I would even propose that we just remove step four. If, once, if you had a higher bar at step one, I think then, you know, to commission or to council member Shimoni's point, you know, and, and then we've determined that there is an issue, then we just work towards resolving it. Um, rather than putting it back into you know the debate of whether or not the community wants it so those would be my particular recommendations um, i know we're trying to get to approval and adoption and potential adoption was on the agenda um, i don't know if other commissioner I, mean, I definitely hear some edits from commissioner koenig and then i think you know still some debate over this item about how how the survey would work or maybe a potential change there. Um, I guess I'm looking to staff a little to say, are those easy cleanups that if the commission's in agreement with them, we make a motion tonight, or would you rather go back, clean it up one more time and bring it back to us in February for a final? That's a good question. I might look to Jeff for this one. The plan was to get some clear guidance tonight on some of these items. So I would, I might ask if we could go back through a couple of the slides where we had questions and make sure we have consensus. And then our plan was to, if I may have agendized it wrong, but we didn't want adoption tonight. We did want to come back one more time um, for adoption, knowing we would have a little bit of comment tonight. So 
I would propose that we just bounce back through a couple of the questions. Through the sure five items. Okay. Yeah, make sure we're on the same page on all these so that we can edit and and we will catch that cut through one. I know you told us last time. Yeah. Okay. Does Let's that work? That. that work for you? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to put a comment in there around the percentages. Um, I realize that the complication of people of, of uh, non-resident owners makes it really challenging. Um, I do think it's important to have some sort of consensus around the properties that are directly impacted. You know, we've had before commission people who are, are experiencing it, who live directly next to some of the things that are, they're experiencing in university and how it impacts their day-to-day -day life and experience. And so um, while we're well, we can change that. Well, I'd be open to changing that 65%, uh, you know, that 100% agreement, maybe change the language from property owner to resident with some kind of thing about how they've lived there for six months or something, or within the past six months um, would help to get around that, um, or property owner if it's a full-time resident. Uh, but I think it's important for the people that are living there that we have their, we get their buy-in to put stuff in front of their house. Thank you. Are there, do other commissioners want to weigh in on, this was one of the particular questions, I think number four, neighborhood approval. Um, other commissioners have thoughts on how to move forward with this one? Uh, Commissioner Eckhoff, that's not a new chat, right? That's an old one. <laughs> that's all right. I'm, my wheels are turning anyway. I think I'm in agreement with your point of, you know, revisiting that step four and looking at our step one to be supportive of the whole process moving forward and looking at the slide. Uh, I think I'm not sure which slide I'm on, but uh, what others are doing two out of seven municipalities and there's the Cincinnati uh, model that's requiring signatures from 50% of residents within the, within the affected area. Um, is that kind of what you're getting at, Chair Morley, on, you know, first round uh, to really address the issue and then move forward? We're moving step four. Yeah, that's aligned with what I'm thinking is move those percentages up to step one and then potentially eliminating step four. But I think we're hearing from um, uh, Commissioner Koenig that the portion of step four that's related to the immediately impacted residents is important to him. And that is how Cincinnati does it. They don't have a step four. Like they do the 50% petition in the beginning. They do the study and if it qualifies, like it's in the list, they have a very long list of items that they need to do. And that's similar in all the places we look, they all have like backlogs of places they're trying to do. Seattle doesn't even accept new applications. Like it's kind of like a ongoing issue everywhere that they all have these backlogs. So yeah, that, that'd be interesting to get rid of step four and just kind of um, approval in the beginning with the concession that later on, the people right next to it, you'd have to work with them to make sure they're okay with it and maybe change the location if they're not. I just point out that but just before you go there, that was the only thing that were, there was consensus on of the communities we looked at. All seven required step four. Or, or neighborhood approvals. Since neighborhood we're approvals. Yeah. I don't know if that's what we're calling step four. I might be confused, but all all required the, you know, that affected area analysis and we're recommending 65%. Only two required the 100%. And the kind of the horror stories, if you will, are, you know, these things get installed and then you get a petition to remove them. We haven't had that happen, but we've had a, quite a bit now of a recommendation from the commission. We move forward and then, you know, one person or a couple of people come back and want to revisit. That's happened to us a couple of times. And that's the, that's the reason to have this is that you really have strong consensus before you move forward. And there's a chance you don't get there. You know, you may have a street that that we all agree needs some work, but the community can't agree on what the right solution is. So that's that's a potential. We heard that from some communities that does happen. So. Um, and I do, uh, yeah, and we have also heard that trying to make this easier. And so adding that 50% burden up front on individuals, you know, the nice thing about the 50% burden here is the city sends out postcards and it's not an individual that has to go around and talk to their neighbors who they may or may not have good relationships with. Hopefully they're talking to them, but uh, yeah. And so I, I would be concerned with saying we have to have 50% upfront signatures that are gotten by citizens. Um, Commissioner Maza, Crookshank, do you guys have any feelings? And then I, I recognize we don't have to have consensus on a, on this commission. We do need a, to be able to give staff direction that they can depend on for 
in a you know a majority vote at some point, but it's okay if there's not always full consensus. <laughs> So I, I appreciate this conversation and, and really having the first go around of seeing this as a new commissioner, um, just taking it all in. I really understand, you know, the complexity that goes along with this neighborhood approval. I absolutely uh, support Chair Morley's recommendation of a little bit more front loading um, and, and how that ultimately could assist at the end um, with the overall neighborhood approval. I also understand that, you know, where these um, mitigation treatments are located, you know, we want them to be in the best location. It's not going to be perfect always, but, you know, there's, there's certainly, you know, five feet up might make all the difference in the world um, type situation. And so, you know, I like the direction we're heading. I don't have a specific number if it's 50 or 100 or this or that, just because I don't have the background knowledge to present to this, but just wanted to lend my support with the conversation and the direction that this is going in. All right. uh, Commissioner Crookshank. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I'm, I think I'm kind of in agreement that, the, that step four does need to be there. Um, but I would be comfortable with, say, you know, a 50% approval or, you know, if you want to make it a simple majority. Um, the thing I do worry about is the 100% because one thing I would hate to see is to have, say, the community vote and there's, say, an 80% approval among the, amongst the residents in the affected area, but then one resident can just shut the project down. So I don't know what that immediate adjacent area percentage should be, but I don't think I'm in favor of the 100%. Um, so I guess that's my thoughts, thank you. And I see a question from Commissioner Eckhoff. I think it's been addressed and, and, and not to belabor the point, but I'm looking at this process and, you know, the neighborhood approval process, you know, being potentially, you know, caught again, uh, Commissioner um, uh, Maza on the front side, front loading this effort, but then also including, still including public comment in the Transportation Commission involvement process. And, you know, the, st the state that, you know, the commission is going to consider, you know, potential interventions. That is a, that's a great opportunity for um, that, that neighborhood involvement in that process if we consider the step four removal, which I'm, I'm you know, on, on the fence about. Sorry, now I'm like digging in. Um, hmm. I, I, I do think that we also, going back to my original comment about households, property owners, um, to uh, Commissioner Eckhoff's statement and then subsequent statements regarding the difference between someone who resides there, a property owner, and you know, digging in and seeing the non-responsive resident counted as a no vote. You know, is the property owner the resident at that point in time? Um, because you switch from property owner to resident, and so there is a, le a level of ambiguity there, and I think we could get ourselves caught. Um, but you know, knowing that we do have several absentee landlords around the around the city um you know who might not respond to something like this you know i i don't want it to fall on deaf ears and have the traffic mitigation not go forward because we don't hit that threshold to council or um, commissioner krishank's um, point as well so thank you yeah yeah, so maybe not 100%. Um, that may be too high of a bar, and it may stop it from happening just due to one person. But, yeah. And what we've seen other places do, like Peoria, for example, they state, like, in their voting system, like, they vote later on in the process, but it says, like, by voting yes, you're acknowledging that you could have traffic calming near your home. And that kind of like locks them in. So like, they're like, okay, yeah. And they might get to the point where it's like, oh, I don't really want this right here. And it's like, well, like you voted and that might not be the best way to approach it, but it is another option that we've seen people do. Like maybe in the beginning, like, hey, if you want traffic, call me, it could potentially be near your home. 
and of course we would work with citizens if they come in it's like hey like i don't want this right next to my bedroom window it's like okay let's see if we can shift this a little bit maybe it's acknowledging that you could have near the home and then at a further public meeting it's a chance for them to talk about it and maybe make changes i'm not sure maybe okay let me see if i can throw out something we might all be able to agree to and then um or and if not maybe we send you guys back to try to sort this out a little more but one idea i have listening to the conversation is a higher threshold up front um maybe it's not a percentage but maybe it's five signatures now maybe we want to get that to 20 signatures or up to a you know if the area is not that big you could um lower it a little bit um and then maybe i'm hearing specific concern about the people immediately adjacent to what's being installed um, and so once you get the broad neighborhood approval with the signatures to explore it then there's maybe it's a majority of the immediate of the um, immediately adjacent neighbors support it and it's really just a you know 51 percent um, that way you're not having a minority um, shut a project down if there's the overall su support. Is that an idea that the commission could maybe get behind to try to meet part way? Yeah. Before I answer that, yeah. just one quick question. I mean, we can revisit this after a year mm -hmm. and see how this played out. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something that we also could make a recommendation on is we want this to go forward. We want to mitigate the barriers to allow these you know traffic calming uh, requests and then also implementation to go forward and so I would love to also hear feedback from those who submitted applications as to how they saw the application process unfold and see if there's other places as well is that something that we could also kind of add to the mix yeah cut reviewing I mean, in a year yeah I mean through the through to the discussion but I mean yeah. everything that you've said chair Morley I would like to see and get behind I, I support that process I, I think that's a great idea um I, what do you think Jeff as far as reviewing the document like yearly yeah and and there's no timing on getting this approved or done I mean we want to get it done, done as quick as possible but if you can't quite get there tonight or need a little more time to think about it, it that's okay we don't have to adopt at the next meeting I mean I know yeah we <laughs> We've been through this a couple of meetings, but we are each time digging in deeper and a little bit more. So that's it's good. That's what we want to do. But I just want to let you know there's not really pressure to get this done tonight. <laughs> and we do have a lot of feedback even now that we can work on, like update this and come back even stronger at the next meeting. But I'm also very happy to go through the rest of the slides and get and get more feedback. Great. Uh, any other thoughts from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Eckhoff? Um, if it didn't come across in my comment earlier, I would like to see the staff recommendation annual budget um, increased. I don't know if anybody else agrees with that. Um, $50,000 seems low. Uh, if we can be aspirational there, great. If we land back at 50, okay, but let's try for higher. Thank you for that reminder. I concur. I think we can also ed maybe edit the letter coming later tonight if we need to. All right, well, not seeing other comments, I'll take some sort of yes, general direction. Are you guys feeling okay for coming up with something for next meeting? I think so. I think I have okay. ample um, edits and feedback to be able to create something new, and I really appreciate it. All of the, the feedback is really great. Are there, I know we there were five questions for us. Mm -hmm. Do we need to go through any of the others? Do you have, to Jeff's point? I'm gonna go to the overview. Do you need more direction on affected area or commission involvement? I, I would say the last one, if we could, would be commission involvement. Like I know we talked about two meetings. Is that something you think we should still do? Or would you want to lean towards like one meeting to approve it at the end? Or I just kind of want to see what your thoughts were there. Um, I'll provide a little context for the commission. So typically in the past, when the matrix was filled out at that point, staff has brought us the matrix to confirm that we want to move forward then they tried the thing out and then brought it back to us again for a final yes on approval and that i think that's what's mimicked here in front of us so that that is aligned with the way the transportation commission has had it i think there was some discussion at the last meeting from commissioners about trying to get the commission out of the weeds of some of the design pieces 
Um, and so some discussion about whether or not we should, you know, really be looking at design or just giving the blessing to move forward um, to staff. If anyone has, that's the history, if anyone has any strong feelings. Commissioner Conant. Um, not strong feelings, but I think the way it's currently laid out in the flow chart is, is good. And I think, you know, um, I realize that has us involved twice and I think we can work with the, yeah, we can work to make sure that step three is a, um, it's more of a presentation for any, it's more of a presentation than us selecting something, but the opportunity for public input. Thank you. Agreed whole, uh, holistically and to add to that, that's step six in terms of the evaluation. I think that that is where we also can have ongoing feedback as to how not only the traffic calming, but the process is, you know, how the process is working as well. Uh, thank you and seeing no other comments, I'm going to take that as agreement from the rest of the commission. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, David. It was a very well laid out presentation and appreciate the areas of where you wanted input. Excellent. All right, going back to the number two item on the agenda for new business, uh, we have the naming of Sheep's Crossing Foots for Cosmic Ray. Chair Morley, members of the commission, uh, my name is Martin Entz. I'm the multimodal transportation planner for the city. And uh, this item is a request to name the tunnel along the Sheep Crossing Footstat Trail in uh, memory of Cosmic Ray Broody. Uh, a little bit of, bit of background. And I'll, I'll skip ahead. We're looking for um, a recommendation from this group to the city council as part of the process. Uh, this is a citizen initiated request to name the tunnel. Uh, the city has a policy uh, that's spelled out carefully um, and expressed in resolution 2001-73, which I think was part of your packet. Uh, we've done this before with a few city facilities. Um, I gave some examples there of the Karen Cooper Trail, uh, the Nate Avery Trail, and the Matt Kelly Bridge have all been named under a, a similar process in using the uh, resolution 2001-73. Uh, just in, in really general terms, the process in, includes getting a formal request uh, from uh, citizens or residents. Uh, it's submitted to the city manager. Uh, they indicate what they want to happen and provide some justification for it. Uh, that request is reviewed by the appropriate city commissions. Um, I'll go into who that is in, in just a few slides. Uh, they recommend, they make a recommendation to the city council who makes a final determination on the naming and all along the way in conjunction with that process we do public outreach to make sure that uh, all of our residents and citizens have an opportunity to provide their thoughts on the proposal uh, so here's the review schedule and the commissions and committees that are involved in in this process uh, bike advisory reviewed it on november 3rd at the regular meeting uh, they recommended approval of the renaming uh, to this commission uh, pedestrian advisory committee will review, review it at their meeting tomorrow night uh, so you do, do not have the benefit at the moment of uh, their deliberations and recommendation. Uh, Transportation Commission is tonight, and then we'll take it finally to the Parks and Rec Commission um, on December 19th. Uh, we anticipate going to City Council sometime in January, but we don't have a, a firm date for that set. Uh, in terms of the community outreach, the, the uh, individuals who initiated the request have already provided a petition with 150 signatures on it. Um, once we received the request, we opened a survey on the Flagstaff Community Forum, which just closed uh, last weekend. Uh, we received 362 responses, 92.5% were in favor of the naming, uh, which leaves 7.5% who um, expressed some concerns. Uh, they generally were uh, in regard to um, potentially naming a different facility, like an entire trail versus a tunnel, and there were a number of comments that expressed concerns about the, the sheep history of the tunnel and, and making sure that that is kept intact as well. Um, I'll just speak to that last concern just for a moment. Uh, we've been communicating with the city's beautification program um, about how we might successfully do both, uh, which means name the tunnel for Cosmic Ray 
and include some information about the sheep history of that tunnel. And, and I, I should probably take a step back and just explain what that is. Um, when Interstate 17 was built in the 1950s, they included these two tunnels uh, intentionally for sheep to be able to get underneath the new highway because uh, there were there were sheep herding ranches on the east side of the highway and uh, they have seasonal movement from winter to, to um, summer um, from low elevation to high elevation. And so they needed a way to get uh, really very large herds of sheep underneath the interstate um, safely. A little bit, this, this is um, the criteria is taken from ordinance 201173. Uh, this lists the naming criteria if, if something is named after an individual. Um, I'll skip the first few bullet points, but go down to the, the fourth one, which talks about the individual being deceased for a minimum of two years. Uh, that condition has been met in this case. A little bit about Cosmic Ray. Um, many of you may be familiar with, with him. His uh, birth name was Raymond J. Broody. He was born in 1946. Uh, he moved here in 1979 and worked as a mechanic at the original Cosmic Cycles. Um, sometime around then, he adopted the Cosmic Ray moniker, and shortly thereafter, he published uh, Fat Tire Tales and Trails, which was one of the original mountain biking guides for uh, Flagstaff in Arizona. Uh, he passed on October 2nd, 2020, at the age of 74. Um, I listed here kind of staff's recommendation or opinion regarding the justification for it. Uh, I think it largely relates to his publishing of, of the book Fat Tire Tales and Trails. Like I said, that was one of the original mountain biking um, books. At the time it was published, 1988, mountain biking was really a brand new sport. Um, that book, that guidebook has become iconic. It's still popular today. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of us have a copy, some version of it on our shelves someplace and have referred to it. Um, in, in essence, it, it helped put Flagstaff on the map as a destination for uh, not only mountain biking, but hiking as well. Uh, the bottom bullet point lists a few other things, uh, ways that Ray contributed to the, the biking community and the uh, biking ethos in, here in Flagstaff. A little bit about the Sheep Crossing Foots. Uh, it's an aggregate trail, uh, about eight-tenths of a mile in length. We completed it in late 2020. Uh, it essentially connects the Ponderosa Trails neighborhood to Fort Tuthill using existing tunnels under I-17. Uh, those tunnels, as I, as I mentioned, were built to move sheep herds. They were, they were built in 1960. Uh, they consist of two concrete boxes that are each 10 by 10. Uh, we have taken the south box for the, for the trail. Uh, the north box remains kind of in, in its original condition for um, some ancillary drainage. And if you're unfamiliar with it, here is a, a map. Uh, this is the Ponderosa Trails neighborhood. This is Fort Tuthill. Uh, Foots Trails existing are shown in orange. The Sheep Crossing Trail is shown in purple. And Interstate 17 is, is this uh, gray line. Uh, what's before you tonight is, is really the, the simply the process to, to name the tunnel for Cosmic Ray. Uh, the, the, um, Individuals who initiated the process are looking into um, how to do a more something uh, permanent in the way of a memorial or a work of art at that location, and that really is a separate process which is ongoing, uh, and we're working with uh, the beautification programs to, to help with that. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. I will note that uh, the two individuals are present tonight. Uh, Teo Mellis is in the room. And Kay Pfeiffer is, is uh, with us online. With your permission, I would ask them to maybe say a few words on, um, on what they've worked on. Yes, please. Yes, come on up. Uh, good evening, commissioners and uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Teo Mellis. I live at 112 North Aztec Street. I've been a resident here since 1981. First as a student, later employed and gainfully employed. I've known or I knew uh, Cosmic Ray for almost 40 years. And um, he passed away rather suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, he'd generally been in really good health. And we were commonly riding together because we're bicyclists. 
both in Europe and here in Flagstaff frequently watching the construction and renewal of this sheep crossing tunnel. Um, he died early in October of 2020, just before the tunnel was open for business. And that was unfortunate because Ray tended to really kind of like riding through pedestrian bicycle tunnels and making noise. And he had a, ch a childlike side to him, as you can imagine, we both do. Um, after he passed away, I, uh, I rode through the tunnel for the first time after it was opened to the public. And just um, Kay, who's with us also, uh, after he passed away, said, you know, I'd really like to initiate some sort of a memorial for our friend Ray. And uh, I said, well, have you been out to the new tunnel? She hadn't, we went out there on and on. Um, that was over two years ago. So um, Ray was also involved in innovating other types of guides. This one for Grand Canyon South Rim visitors who might come and look at all the, the great monuments of the canyon but not have a clue what they were looking at. So he was in the process of generating this guide which talks about first ascent of people who actually climbed those features. And um, so even though, even though he was age 74, he was still active. He was publishing, he was up, upgrading and uh, revising his guides. He had a brand, a, a new version of a guide for the Phoenix metro area hiking guide, things like that. Um, so he's, he's, he's missed, I think, by a lot of people. We had a memorial for Ray, everybody who signed the, the proposal and you know said, well, we should do something for Ray. And they thought that was a great idea. I really commend the city uh, especially Martin for posting the citizen survey and I uh, thought it was well received and and I also wanted to say that we had signatures sent to me uh, from Europe by people who knew Ray who thought this would be appropriate who don't even live here so um, I'll defer to Kay if she wants she's actually the proposer um, but I thank you for your time and consideration for this uh, possible memorial and the artwork that Martin talked about I specifically want to mention that some people said, well, perhaps we should name a more central feature in the city for Raymond Broody that more people would see. But this one has a great potential for mural art because of its size and its nature and the fact that I believe it leads into a beautiful park, which we all enjoy, Fort Tuthill. And um, perhaps in the future with further development within the city, it will become more of a central feature of the city rather than something that's sort of on the periphery. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Kay, would you like to say a couple words? Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank Martin for all the effort that he's put into this project as well. And I read a lot of the um, the comments regarding the sur survey and they're, they're notable. There's, but I'm, I'm impressed with the, the number of people who've actually re uh, responded to the survey as well as comment on it. Um, I've known Ray for uh, oh, as uh, longer than Teo has. He's he's we became friends through outdoor activity. He's he's taken on my family as as his family as as well as we've taken on his family as our family. So we've been very close. So upon his death, um, I suggested the possibility as as Teo mentioned of having some sort of a memorial. I think he was an inspiration to the community as as far as the, especially the outdoor community for biking and, and outdoor activities. And he he oftentimes, I mean, um, I think it was noted previously that uh, the cause of his death, he he had stopped at an underpass and was uh, got off his bike and slipped on the concrete in the underpass, cleaning up a mess that other people had left, had left there. And he slipped and he, Cut himself. He hurt himself, and that was what eventually turned to sepsis, which is was the his ultimately his demise. He he died of sepsis as a result of those injuries. But he was an inspiration as far as meeting people and and being a uh, um, a help to the community. Uh, um, and I've been working as well with the beautification committee to um, with regard to this specific request to, to name the the Futz Tunnel in Ray's memory, as well as to perhaps um, provide some, some artwork and with some sheep in the artwork, but actually that would be probably a, a three phase project due to the fact that um, fundraising is an issue right now. But as far as I could tell that the, the uh, beautification committee was, was quite, um, they were enthusiastic, enthusiastic about the proposal, but um, it's just a matter of getting the money to, 
to get the project going. So, so yeah, that's that's my uh, contribution. And I thank Teo. He's done also a huge amount of work, you know, as far as collecting uh, signatures and um, just sort of keeping us all on task and in, in getting this project underway and completed. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you, and um, for both of you on behalf of the commission, I think we're all sorry for your loss. Um, are there any uh, questions from commissioners? Seeing none, are there uh, any members of the public here to speak on this item? Also seeing none, uh, I'll open it up for commissioner discussion or if somebody, uh, I think we are looking for action, right? Uh, yes, um, to make a recommendation to council uh, on the naming of the crossing. Commissioner Mazza. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you both for your insight to this um, because, you know, looking at Martin's presentation, it spurred a question for me um, was, why a tunnel at the outskirt of town? Why not a full trail? And, you know, can, and, you know, and can we preserve some of that sheep crossing history? Because that was new and, novel, and, and good information. And, um, an interesting part of our history as well. So thank you both for providing me with enough insight as to why this location. And I, I, I was really moved and got goosebumps. Um, he was such an instrumental figure in actually us moving to Flagstaff. So, um, and we have broken the, the uh, spine of that book more times than I can think of. Um, so I, I, again, I now understand better um, as to why this location, um, my only, I, I support this wholeheartedly. The only recommendation, recommendation I have is that as we move forward with the beautification commission, I believe is the right one. i um, love to also get the community's understanding as to this sheep crossing as well. Um, and the history of it, it's, it's original intention. I think that that's important uh, to not lose as well. So I'm in support. Thank you. Um, I guess I have one question, um, and and I realize they're two separate, the artwork versus the naming. But um, typically, when we name something like this, do we put a plaque there to describe that, or would that be covered in the beautification, where that would be a separate thing to explain to people what the naming is? Uh, Commissioner, in the in the past, it's kind of um, varied. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the three examples that we brought up for the Karen Cooper trail. Uh, we put a couple of benches and a plaque that uh, for a memorial uh, toward the north end of the trail. Uh, for the Matt Kelly bridge, we put the two kind of rock uh, obelisks at either end with a plaque with his, with his, uh, with the name in it. And for the Nate Avery trail, uh, it, it's really acknowledged in the uh, kind of that triptych uh, sign at the entrance to Buffalo park. Um, those, all three of those were, were kind of city efforts. Um, you know, in the, in the case of the, the first two, um, you know, not, not grand gestures, they, they were you know, reasonably small. And in, for the third one, a lot of that was related to Buffalo Park and some improvements as well. So we really, to really answer your question, we really don't have a precedent. Um, I think we could help with a, with a memorial plaque or something like that. But if, if it goes beyond that for like a mural and, um, as, Kay and Teo indicated they're working with beautification on a beautification and action grant that would help um, defray some of those costs. Thanks. Uh, I don't see any other um, comments from the commission. Would anybody like to make a motion? Um, I will recommend uh, that as the commission we uh, uh, suggest that the whatever the approval process for this would be that we recommend as the city council yeah we recommend the city council that they approve this uh recommendation thank you is there a second second thank i'll second you. that oh sorry commissioner eckhoff you got beat out um by commissioner Massa. uh with that um person. yeah <laughs> it's hard online <laughs> um <laughs> uh any further discussion all those in favor Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Seeing none, the motion passes. And um, thank you again for coming today to tell the story. Uh, the next item on the agenda are the Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Committee appointments. Martin, or you just want us to move forward? You want us to do this? Okay. Do we need separate motions for each member? Can they, is there a rule around that? They can be made together. All right. So in your packet, you should have seen some um, potential appointments to the Bike Advisory Committee and then one appointment to the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, and it sounds like we can entertain it all in one motion if um, somebody uh, is so moved. Hopefully you've read their applications and their interest. Um, are there any questions on any of the applicants or the process? Oops, sorry. I'm going to look at the team's chat. Hold on. Uh, seeing none, are there, is, are there any members of the public here to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'll uh, turn it back to commission for discussion or approval. Does anybody need help remembering the names? <laughs> I have, yes. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Um, and I'd like to make a motion uh, to follow the um, lead on the appointments and reappointments as noted in the staff packet for the two pedestrian advisory committee members, Matt McGrath, Ron Norton, and the bicycle advisory committee member, Valerie, and I'm, please help me with her last name. Pyatt. Pyatt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? I will second that. All right. Oh, Commissioner Eckhoff. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? All right. Uh, all those in favor, aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? Uh, seeing none, the motion also passes. All right. Now we're moving on to the old business section of the agenda, and we have the Fremont Boulevard traffic calming. Thank you, Chair Morley, members of the commission. Uh, this item is um, our intent here is to give you a couple of ideas and options for engaging the neighborhood uh, regarding doing a, um, coming up with some options for traffic calming along Fremont Boulevard. And this is, um, we're really just looking for your uh, thoughts and comments on some of the ideas and, and um, this is sort of a general conversation. We'll we'll sketch a few broad brushstrokes for how we might engage the neighborhood and, and generate some ideas from uh, the people who live along there. So here, here's an, our outline, a little bit of background in history, uh, the intent of this, um, how we might do messaging, uh, some ideas for public engagement, and then a short discussion about opportunities for public art. And before we get started in, in kind of earnest, I just want to make a couple of, of points about the process. Uh, one is that it feels like it's somewhat important to establish a few parameters in these discussions uh, based on funding and feasibility. Uh, for example, we could come up with an idea of, of building a pedestrian overpass over Fremont, but nobody has the money for that. So is it is it really productive to have that as, as one of our options? Um, similarly, on the feasibility front, we could we could propose speed bumps every 40 feet, but that may not be feasible for the road. Uh, so again, not not productive. So we want to make sure that we that we provide uh, guidance for the commission and the city council and the, and the neighborhood in a way that will be most productive to to resolve some of the concerns and help the project move forward. Uh, the second point is that we're providing you with with kind of a wide range of options here. Uh, we'd like to do as much as we can, but not all of them may, may prove to be uh, possible in, in the way of public outreach. Um, so as we go through them, if you have any thoughts or about uh, which ones seem to be most important or the things that we want to make sure that we hit, uh, please let us know. And then the last one is kind of generally about community engagement. And uh, typically community engagement 
uh, goes as far as we have is always limited by funding and, and staff resources. And in other words, we do as much as we can with the with the resources, the time, and the staff that we have available. Um, I don't think there's a there's a clear and bright line that we know that we've crossed to hit uh, a threshold for enough community engagement. So we'll we'll do the best we can. Uh, but please understand that that there are some limitations in the way of resources as we move forward. Uh, so with that, just a real quick history. Uh, the neighborhood did, did bring some concerns to our to the city's attention about speeding along Fremont. Uh, in response, we collected data in 2021 uh, for uh, speeds and volumes. Uh, a couple of potential options were presented at the Transportation Commission, uh, and the neighborhood expressed some concerns about about some of those options. So uh, we're we're kind of at a, a point in the process where we're uh, going back to the neighborhood and working with them to come up with. Uh, potentially other options for um, solving their concerns. Uh, our intent here uh, with public engagement is to provide the residents with an opportunity to participate in a meaningful way. So we really want to we really want to hear from them um, and uh, some of their concerns. Uh, that helps us better understand the both the nature of concerns or problems in along Fremont uh, and their very specific location. Uh, we also want to help provide the, the residents with op with information on different options. And this refers a little bit back to the parameters that I talked about to make sure that what we're talking about is, is a productive conversation. Uh, that also relates to managing expectations about funding and how we implement it. And ideally we can develop some short-term and long-term recommendations. Um, although I think, you know, given funding limitations that the short-term are the other ones that we'll be able to do for the for that street in the neighborhood. Uh, for messaging, um, it's important to know that we have limited funds for improvement, so it ends up being preferable to do something with the, with the uh, money that we have versus waiting for a long long term solution that may take uh, a number of years to get funded. Um, information on what design options are feasible and which are not um, as well. That could be which ones work best uh, in the given whatever problems there are and, and the, the circumstances. And we can talk about, you know, what are some of the drawbacks and advantages of, of different options as we go along. So it's an opportunity for us to learn from the neighborhood, but also help uh, educate the neighborhood and bring them along with with what things are possible and what works best and what work, might work best here. A couple of engagement options, uh, three, actually one is is the form of a walkability assessment. And we call these walkability assessments. It, it's a it's a process where we we gather the neighborhood, and go walk the neighborhood and, and kind of learn from them uh, where issues are, where concerns are, how things work on the ground. And at the same time, it, it's a process of discovery. So we can see things on the ground, uh, different features of the roadway or the sidewalk or the bike lanes or whatever that that uh, promote walkability or bikeability or that detract from it. And then, uh, the example that I always think of when we've done these in the past is you can see how a very wide radius on a corner um, impacts walkability. And uh, while it's one thing to explain that to somebody in a meeting or in another context, I think seeing it on, on the ground and kind of discovering it as the group walks along is, is a little bit more compelling. Um, in this case, I, I think although we call it here a walkability assessment, I think we could we could have it be a little bit more uh, broadly defined to kind of cover whatever traffic or walking or biking issues um, exist along Fremont. Uh, the second is a design charrette. This would be an in-person, potentially with an online option uh, meeting. Uh, we could have it at City Hall. We could have it at the library. Uh, these things always seem to work best if you can get close to the neighborhood. So if, if follow were willing to host us, for example, that would be preferable. Um, we could we could try to tie in teams, to, but it, but I think um, that might provide some challenges because uh, you know these things are kind of interactive in a way, and not always conducive to a virtual meeting. Uh, we'd invite participants to uh, draw on an aerial of the corridor. And in that way, that'd be kind of a stand-in for actually walking along the corridor. If we if we weren't able to do that, at least we'd, we'd be able to draw on the aerial and kind of the same principles. We we want to hear from them, where the locations are, what the concerns are, and then we could talk through what some of the potential solutions might be. Um, I, I kind of look at the the this one and the walkability assessment before it as, as maybe an either-or option. Like we we pick one or the other. Um, if we could do both, that would be great. But if 
one or the other at, at least. And then the last one is an online survey. And I, I think this one would be in addition to um, either one or both of the other two. Uh, we'll host it on the community forum. Uh, there's an option where we can, we can uh, provide a map and they can actually literally put dots on the map and then tell us like what's going on at that, at that particular location. Um, we can also have them identify other concerns or answer questions about um, some of the situation. Uh, this option, if it were our only option, gives us uh, not very much op opportunity for interaction. We really can't talk to people, we're just hearing from them. But because it's open over a period of several weeks, more people could potentially participate um, and, and they're not bound by their schedules if they're unable to make one of the other two um, meetings. Uh, it could also be used in the form of a backup. So we hear and collect information from the neighborhood through one of the two or both of the first options. And then we make sure that we've heard correctly and are, are responding in, in a way that um, shows an understanding of the problem as, as part of that survey. Uh, a little bit about public art. And I, and I believe that the neighborhood did express an interest in having that as a, as a component of the project. Uh, I think the city's role would be to help identify some places in advance where public art might be an opportunity. And uh, this is kind of a um, part of what you talked about in an earlier agenda item uh, regarding public art and, and crosswalks. Uh, this part of it um, should be community driven and implemented so the city could help make it happen, but we wouldn't be the ones who are um, leading it forward. That would be up to the community. Uh, there's an opportunity here to partner with FALA located along the corridor and the city's beautification program and sustainability program are also interested in, in helping kind of guide that effort. A little bit about our strategy for communication. Uh, typically for these sorts of things we do, we reach out citywide through the, uh, the notify me feature on the city's website. Uh, we have about 750 emails collected that you know, we send out notices of, of meetings and uh, different items of interest regarding walking, biking, or the foot trails. Um, in this case, oh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, also, um, part of our strategy is using social media. So like the Foots Facebook page or the sustainability Facebook or the city's Facebook page, but that, that really reaches an audience that's the whole city. Uh, we'd also wanna target the neighborhood um, here we could start with uh, who we currently have for contacts, ask them to help us spread the word um, through, their, through their neighbors. Um, it might be possible to do a neighborhood mailing um, for the whole neighborhood, and we could potentially place signs along the corridor to let people know uh, about the process and any particular meetings that are coming up. Uh, the third one I think is, is important, that we provide feedback to the neighborhood about what we've heard to make sure that we've got it right and to kind of um, um, guarantee or give them some assurances that we're, that we're using this data, how we're using it and um, how it results or how we're using it in the, in the final recommendations. Um, it might be possible to include some of the information on a simple project website. And this wouldn't be anything like standalone or, or far reaching, but we could, we could dedicate a page in the city's website to, to make sure that there's information provided whenever people wanna access it. Um, and that the, between the, the website and the survey that we talked about that addresses some options for people who wouldn't be able to attend uh, particular events that we would hold. So I think that's the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to hear your comments and answer any questions. Thank you, Martin. Questions from the commission? I just have one, Martin. Um, and the first two options, the walkability assessment or the um, design shred, do you see a major level, a difference in the level of effort between those two items? And have you talked at all to the beautification team to see if they have a preference between those two? Uh, second question, we haven't, we haven't talked to, to beautification about um, what they might prefer. Uh, first question, I think, um, probably the in-person meeting would, would take a little bit more preparation just, just for getting materials together and printing out maps and that sort of thing. Um, whereas a walkability assessment, um, it might, we might have a few materials to bring to them, but it's more kind of on the ground and um, 
has more of an informal feeling. Thank you. Commissioner Koenig. Um, sort of as a question of part of this process, um, I guess like what you're presenting these all as options. Um, is this the start of the process or has there already been some sort of public outreach or, um, yeah. The, there has been public outreach in, in the uh, work that's been done so far. Uh, I would ask Jeff to, if, if he has any detail on describing that. So this was a neighborhood calming request that came through the commission through kind of the normal process. And as we progressed with, so I think it was, I think it said February, um, the commission kind of heard this item for the last time and recommended restriping the street. Of course, Fremont's super wide. So we came up with a striping plan to try to fill up all the pavement with stuff, you know, super wide bike lanes and all that stuff. Um, and we put a, an image of that in a weekly report or a monthly report to city council and some neighbors uh, saw it and said, oh, we don't like this at all and came to city council and said, hey, we want you to rethink this or start over however you want to say that. And I think several of those people are here tonight. They're going to want to talk. But so we said, OK, let's see what we could come up with staff driven that doesn't cost, you know, consultant time, and obviously like staff time, but we can manage that for the most part. So that's what we're kind of offering as far as background. Sorry. Yeah, this is kind of predated you, I think, on the commissioner, probably most everybody. So, yeah, that's a little extra background. Thanks. I think it was at the. I think I was actually at that meeting. I just was trying to clarify what, if there had already been meetings or not, and so um, that was helpful. Thanks. I don't see any other questions from the commission, so I will open it for public comment. Um, if you remember the public that wants to speak on this item, if you could put um, a C or a Q in the chat, um, that would be fantastic. I don't see anyone uh, present in the room. Um, so we'll, we'll start with Sasha Storks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for putting this item on the agenda. Um, and the opportunity to discuss and engage in this process. Um, you know, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of neighbors when I say that we really very much do want to see action to reduce speeding and increase pedestrian and cycling comfort on Fremont. Um, I don't want to leave folks with the uh, impression that we want to throw everything out the window, um, but I think at a minimum, we want the opportunity to refine the design that was um, shown in the city manager's report. Um, we've sent feedback on things like lane widths, uh, the location of bike lanes, uh, things like that. So I think we're here. We're ready to work with you guys. We're really excited about that. Um, and I really appreciate the strategy that's been proposed today. Um, I think from my perspective, the walkability assessment could or the, the opportunity to get out together would be really great um, so that we can all be just looking and pointing at the same thing so that you can see um, what's going on and what we care about and from others as well. Um, but I appreciate the whole range of options and would be excited about any of them. I think I also speak for a number of neighbors when I say um, that we're here to help. Um, <laughs> my background's in facilitation, so um, if you needed help with outreach or making maps or any of those pieces, I think we're here really in the hope of working together. Um, and that, you know, you have you have folks that really care about this and uh, want to help like staff. So, um, you know, I think that's that would be like maybe my vote is getting out and, and walking together so you guys can really understand what we're seeing, but be excited about all of the options um, and even just sort of the the reflection of our feedback on the re restriping plan. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey Cruz. Hi, um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, thank you so much um, for inviting us to comment tonight. And I just want to say thank you so much to um, the city staff members who um, went back and put together this presentation. I really appreciated 
um, seeing the creative options um, like Sasha, I would be very happy to engage on um, any of these. Um, I am a resident within the, the townhomes behind Fala there and the traffic on Fremont like directly impacts me and um, and my family. And so I also think the walkability um, assessment would be really welcome and I would be happy um, to be one of those people that helps, you know, do the word of mouth as you talked about the communication strategy here. Um, and I guess I just want to put in a plug also based on what y'all have been talking about tonight that the restriping and the crosswalk um, both get integrated into um, the conversation that it's not just about the restriping because I think it is all the traffic calming and the safety um, of like the pedestrian users who are maybe going to the park on a regular basis I think are, are the really important pieces but I look forward to having good conversations I'm excited to work with the city on this um, and I am really glad that um, there's this option to look at refining that restriping proposal that we saw a little while ago. So thank you so much for doing this, and I'm in great support of this community engagement. Thank you. Scott Crincala. I hope I said that right. <coughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, good evening again. Uh, thanks, everybody, for you know, bringing this to the meeting. Um, you know, Again, kind of reflect a lot of the points that Tasha and Audrey brought up uh, just regarding you know, really making sure that you know if we approach this project that we kind of have a good foundation for it for what it's going to look like obviously take into account you know that this is a uh, potentially dangerous street you know as a new father uh, who lives on the west side of the neighborhood you know we cross Fremont um, at least once or twice a day when we're going to the park and so you know again just making sure that this prioritizes having you know the ability for crosswalks um, I really like the idea for the community engagement you know having different uh, models, you know, different ideas for this and, and really getting the community involved in that process and then also doing a walkability just to see what it looks like, you know, on the ground. It's hard to kind of see on a map what the nature of these some of these corners are and that, you know, they can be potentially blind, especially with traffic moving pretty fast. So um, again, happy to be involved with you know, this process and just making sure that when we do it, we you know, do it right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, any other members of the public wish to speak on this item? Uh, Kyle Doherty. Hi, Kate. Uh, thanks for letting me speak here. Um, I uh, just wanted to voice my support for an opportunity to walk with a representative of the city um, in the areas where uh, I perceive trouble. Um, and I wanted to just like point out that there's like certain periods of the day when it's most problematic and I think targeting like 4 p.m. to 5.30 is sort of the most informative time period during a weekday when you could do that kind of work. So yeah, I support that kind of on the ground um, engagement and then maybe uh, a effort to sort of process as a group later on. Um, doesn't have to be in real time, but like a, I think there was sort of like a online process proposed earlier where people could draw on maps or whatever to clarify after having carefully considered things. Um, yeah, but I, I generally support refining a plan for um, calming measures specifically around Cheshire Park. And I'm excited about any other opportunities we might have to put in crosswalks or stop signs that could make life easier for us as parents here. Thank you. Thank you. Libby Stork. Hi, can you, uh, I'm not sure if this is working, is it? It's, I hope. it's working, we can hear you. Super, okay. I'm a grandmother of a uh, preschooler and um, I live about three blocks from the park and uh, my grandchild and her family live um, about the same, maybe a less. Um, so, of course, I'm very concerned about how uh, how much uh, how fast the traffic is on there. I really appreciate that um, you're all working with us and uh, trying to make this uh, be improved. 
um, I guess a, a few thoughts that I have um, just um, I think narrowing the traffic lanes is very important. Um, I think the pedestrian uh, crossing issue is very important at both sides of the playground. And um, uh, the traffic that's at FALA, uh, when it's time to drop off or pick up kids, um, just adds to the problem of speeding traffic on this. Really, uh, there's not that many people who uh, need to be going down Fremont, and certainly not at that speed um, it's with that passing. So um, I think the walkability would be super as a, a way to um, address this. Um, and I, uh, I also think that with the question about beautification, that it would be really a shame not to include FALA in trying to uh, help with beautification. After all, it's a school all about art. So um, I'd like it to be safer. I, I uh, am a bike rider also, and I also walk a lot. And so, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate all your efforts to try to help us with this problem. So thank you. Thank you, Julie Kinkle. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for putting all the work into this that you have and having this item on the agenda. Um, I, I feel honored to be able to speak and provide some comment. And, and really, I'm just echoing what my I also live in Cheshire, what my neighbors have said. Um, as a parent, I do usually cross Fremont twice every day. And um, I think it would be it would be super to have a walkability assessment. And as Kyle pointed out earlier, I think it would be crucial to have that during the, the busiest times, like 4 to 5.30. Um, another point I'd like to make is that most of the, the people in Cheshire live on the west side of that park. And so if you go to the park, you're, you're crossing Fremont. Um, not many people don't have to cross Fremont to get to the park. So um, it's it, it would be really wonderful to have a, a good system set up and um, uh, a, a way that we can know that street is safe. Thank you. Um, that is all I see for public comment. So I'll go ahead and close public comment and um, open it for commissioner discussion. Are there any members of the commission? Oh, sorry, we're gonna hold on and do one more public comment, I guess. Thank you, thank you. I had a comment actually in the last agenda too under old business, but it pertains to this as well. I'm, I'm again, I live on Aztec Street downtown which um, is kind of an unusual street in my opinion. I've lived there for over 30 years. It may be the only street in town that has two dead ends. It kind of, the, the southern part of North Aztec kind of ends at the Francis Short Pond and uh, is access for parking for the ballparks as well as part of the Foots Trail. And of course, Northern North Aztec ends in a neighborhood in a cul-de-sac. Um, the segment that I live on, and this I think pertains to the Fremont discussion here, um, has no sidewalks, which is a little bit unusual for most downtown streets, uh, never has had sidewalks. It is uh, a major approach and access to another park, or Thorpe Park. Um, and I know there's planning in place to develop Thorpe Park into its full-blown parkdom. Um, so related to this concept of traffic calming near a park that a lot of people visit. On the street I live on, I think there's the same need for consideration because so many pedestrians, especially children and bicyclists, going to the duck pond, going to the ballpark, and the cars tend to go quite fast from stop sign to stop sign to stop sign. So it's kind of a, a comment on this topic, which I favor and support, but also just to put out there that um, there's another park that has a similar potential need, and it's the one that is near where I live, actually. So thank you for accepting my invitation.
second person comment on this topic. You are welcome. Um, I see a question from Commissioner Eckhoff. Thanks, and, and getting up to speed here. In full disclosure, I'm a resident of Fremont Boulevard as well, and was aware of this general topic, you know, being discussed for quite some time, and recognizing that the commission, you know, discussed this back in February of this year, and some de design elements were put together, and it sounds like, in a preliminary fashion, for an update to to council, I'm curious um, from staff if the data that was collected and the design elements that were put in place. What would expedite this process most? It sounds like you've had feedback for design elements that we could potentially revisit and discuss and bring back to the community for input. Um, is having feet on the ground to do um, you know, walkability assessment, et cetera, going to give you more insights than you have currently to provide some you know, updated design elements for us to consider moving forward? I would hate for this topic to you know, sit on agendas for, for another period of time. I think I can take this one. I mean, I don't know that we have an option at this point that doesn't involve more um, time on the calendar with this. It sounds like I'm, I don't want to jump ahead on you, but it sounds like walkability is the interest. So, you know, getting that scheduled, figuring out the community feedback and then how that can be um, worked into the striping plans is, is the best next step. I think moving forward with the striping plans we have now is not was was not acceptable um, based on the community feedback we had last month. So I think in in any yeah I don't know what the quickest path is, but I think the the path forward is this this walkability step um, and kind of working through the striping plans. And then it, I can jump ahead a little. There isn't funding identified for this. It's a fairly expensive okay. piece because it's such a big street. I think our early estimates were approaching $100,000 to restripe the street. Um, so yeah, there's there's several more steps, but we we have to at least get it figured out what people are interested in, what what may make a difference out there. I appreciate that, Jeff. I think that you know is is to the point of um, you know perhaps a phased approach to this. If you know there's a com community art installation piece, et cetera. I think you know first and foremost, it's, I'm hearing you know community safety as a priority here. You know, via restriping and crosswalks, and if you know the bigger uh, goals of the project are, are, you know, something that we can negotiate in order to get started on those safety features, I'd be, you know, certainly in favor of of moving ahead. But that sounds like exactly what we're proposing here. Um, other commission comments? Yeah, commission. I have a question as a sort of a process question for Jeff and Martin. Um, it sounds to me actually like there's almost two things here, right? A residential traffic management program generally seems to deal with slowing cars down, but it seems like the bigger concern here is that there isn't a crosswalk. And I guess my question is, are, it seems like crosswalks aren't usually considered in this. Is there a separate process? I know Martin, you've worked for a long time to designate, uh, there's a whole list of all the different upcoming projects in the city of Flagstaff and they're already prioritized. Is this already on there? Um, or how would this get added to that? Or is there a need to adjust our traffic management system to include the potential to add crosswalks in there? I can jump into a couple of pieces of that and I'll let Martin add on to it as well. I don't believe anything on this street is identified in the ATMP for crosswalks based on the type of street and the speeds and volumes we see there. Um, so I think that's the quick answer to, is it in the program? No, it's not. We, the ATMP focuses on higher speed volume and higher, typically higher crossing locations too, but Martin will be better at answering that question. I shouldn't have gone there. Um, there is a crosswalk at the park today that's signed and marked. I believe it's signed and marked today. I think the request is for, and that's what we need to figure out with the walkability, because I think um, we've heard a, a lot of requests for crosswalks at a number of locations along that street. So I think part of the walkability focus will be, you know, what, where are the priorities? Is it a safe look? You know, the priority of the walking, is it safe with visibility and all those types of things? I'll let Martin go from here because this is definitely more in his wheelhouse than mine. Uh, Commissioner, yes, what, what Jeff said is correct. We did not have any specific locations identified along here for crossings. We were typically focused on enhanced crossings along busier streets. 
Um, I think there is a potential. We do have we do have money generally identified for different forms of bike lane striping, uh, including converting existing bike lanes to buffered bike lanes. Uh, I, I don't know offhand if the street was included in, as a potential buffered bike lane, but that might be a potential source of, of some money for the restriping. Thank you. And with that, Martin, I would assume that if a walkability study is conducted, you would come to the table to street network with uh, some, some of those, all of those um, existing potential treatments already kind of researched and, you know, ready to go in play. Um, because I, you know, having lived out there once upon a time, um, you know, a buffered bike lane in the, the crosswalks to the park, I, you know, I think, you know, several years ago, that was, you know, certainly of, of great interest, I think, to, to my neighbors as, as well. Um, but I appreciate everyone who came forward tonight and brought comments and, you know, really are interested in, in taking the walkability, um, you know, with city staff so that they can really point out you know, uh, and then allows us to really understand, you know, is there some duplicity there? Is there some opportunities to, you know, kind of commingle and, you know, really kind of, you know, pay attention to the treatments that, you know, are, are best suited for the uh, concerns that they have. Uh, I, yeah, I'll just echo that I'm excited about the solutions I see in front of us and that I'm um, excited about the proposal for the community engagement and having a community that wants to engage at this level um, versus I think some of the others that we've seen where they just want solutions. This feels like a unique opportunity and um, uh, the fall opportunity feels unique. Um, I, I think I'm hearing support from both staff in terms of level of effort and people online that the walkability assessment seems to be like the right way to go. Um, is there additional direction that you need from the commission at this time? Thank you, no. All right, uh, yes, Commissioner Koenig. I mean, so just as a discussion in, right, like it seems like trying to think about, you know, how would we do things differently in the future this seems like a situation that sort of followed this. You know, we did this, we had a public meeting, we selected a traffic calming strategy, I think a road diet sounded really excited and then something fell apart. And so just trying to think among ourselves around um, what happened there and how do we avoid this in the future? And uh, yeah, because it, and, and or was it just the communication that you know, uh, seeing the striping and assuming that was going to be the only thing that happened, whereas, you know, city staff was probably focused on, hey, we can stripe this, let's get this done and then see how this works and then kind of what's the next step. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, just trying to figure out um, how to make this work smoother in the future. We are too. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. Um, yeah, I mean, there was a draft drawing that went out, so it wasn't done. That didn't help the situation. Um, it's a massive street, so no matter unless we remove some asphalt, things are going to be wide. Um, and so that was, I know, some of the concern. Oh, the lane, the, the driving lane's too wide. We, we could certainly change it a foot or whatever. Um, that's not a big deal. That input. I think there's been some input on bike lane positioning on one side or the other of parked cars. I think we have some pretty, well, we'll talk about that with walkability, but I know that was a concern. Um, and then, yeah, this one has a whole nother element of looking for art, which isn't really part of neighborhood traffic calming typically. Um, crosswalks really aren't, they're not gonna change speeds, but so it's a different different kind of animal. So yeah, this, this ended up having kind of three components and you're right, we jumped into what we know too well. Um, and Martin, thankfully, is helping us um, kind of be more well-rounded. I'll add, um, I think I have, I think it relates to what I drafted in the letter for funding. Um, I kind of, I told Jeff, I was like, I don't know, make changes. This was me just spitballing based on what I feel like the commission has heard over the last two years. And part of it, in there, I specifically talk about the residential program and somebody dedicated to that. I think, um, you know, the engineering team has worked hard to try to 
put engineering solutions out there, get them resolved, deal with 16 projects. And I think having a person who's dedicated and maybe has skill sets both on the planning side and the engineering side and can do the community engagement pieces of it um, with dedicated time for the community engagement pieces of it, I hope will be really helpful to making these go smoother in the future. So that is, I think it ties a little bit to what I was thinking. And luckily Jeff liked my idea, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Um, okay, I think I heard, I don't see any of their comments from the commission. Um, so we'll go ahead and close this item. Um, I'm a, if it's okay with you, Jeff, and I believe it is, I think we'll table the role of the transportation commission. Um, I would suggest the commissioners read it, look at it, especially if you're new, it's been a little bit of an ongoing discussion about, um, are we fulfilling the goals and, or should we modify what the commission should be doing? Um, so um we'll bring it back in the future when we have time to have a more robust discussion around that um so moving on to um section four concluding general business um we have reports in our packets from the bike and pet advisory committees um for our new commissioners those committees do report to us and so it's good to look at their work and make sure we're up to speed on what the what they are doing um, Martin, is there anything you wanted to specifically point out from those or just reference the commissioners? Just in a, in a very general sense, Chair Morley, we're, we're transitioning from working on the active transportation master plan to implementing the active transportation master plan now that it has been approved. That's excellent news. It's really exciting. A whole new set of tasks. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck to the committees. Um, all right, um, item B, informational items to and from commissioners and staff. This is just a um, open, the first item, number one, is the open item if there's something a commissioner would like to bring up for the commission. Yeah, Commissioner Koenig. No, you don't. Okay, you look like you were ready. Uh, I don't, anything from commissioners online that they would like to bring forward? Uh, commissioner Eckhoff, yes. Thank you. And and this is probably something that the commission has considered at some point, but um, you know, hearing the conversation around traffic calming in neighborhoods and you know the potential commingling of funds with school zones or schools that have the ability to do some work around, you know, school um, school zone traffic calming. Is that something that we could discuss as a commission? Because it seems like, you know, and in, in obviously being completely fresh, and I appreciate your patience with me, you know, jumping into the commission. But some schools have school zone lighting. Some schools have zone, you know, signs that are rolled out each morning. I'm curious, you know, what potentially funds those school zone issues, and if that could be to potentially something that we could commingle in some of these conversations that we're going to have around, you know, neighborhood traffic calming. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I was actually having a similar thought on around the budget issue for all these ongoing things, and how do we leverage the work that sustainability has money for the le leveraging the work that the beautification commission has funding for so it does feel like we could have a i think a maybe a robust discussion about how can we start leveraging the limited funds we have with other partners to get some of these things done and done well um so yeah i really appreciate that uh commissioner koenig sure thanks um yeah i guess my thing i wanted to sort of bring up as a maybe a question for the future but um regarding the distribution of the Transportation Commission uh, agendas and minutes um, and stuff like that. Um, so the city has a really convenient notify me system and you can go on there and see theirs. And I, I don't know if there's a reason that we have ours separate from theirs. And even on the pedestrian bicycle advisory committee, you can go on there and click a button and say, hey, send me an email whenever this comes out. And that's harder to find for the Transportation Commission and uh, I don't know if we could align that with the city. And I think I saw that there's essentially a, a notify me, you can go on there and you can click and there's uh, six other commissions that allow you to sign up for their email list kind of a thing. And that also then lists their agendas and minutes uh, on the same place. It's not something I'm obviously doing. I didn't even know it was available. So I'll check into it. It's something you're doing already, Martin? You can help me. Dee's got yeah. you covered behind We're you. You're set. Yep. Awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, we can great. do that. It sounds like. <laughs> um, any other items to or from commissioners? 
All right, the second item under here is letter of support for transportation uh, funding. So this has been talked about by the commission the last couple meetings. I think just recognizing the workload that's in front of staff. Our, I will say our commission meetings typically run long. We've talked about having additional meetings, but there, you know, that's additional work for staff to be agendizing, hosting meetings. And so we just seem in this, um, it, I think we're in a place where we are understaffed in the transportation division, quite frankly. Um, can people online still hear us? Yes, okay. Um, I think we're in this place where um, we just need support to get things done, including helping support the Transportation Commission, the work of the residential program. And so, as I mentioned, I drafted a letter um, with some ideas for funding in it, um, looking to see, I don't wanna send this letter unless we have the support of the commission. We typically have not sent a letter to the council on budget related items before. However, um, our council liaison, um, um, uh, Council Member McCarthy has said he thinks it's appropriate for us to do this. Um, so I guess I'm looking for feedback on what's in there, if we're missing anything, and if there's overall support to send it on behalf of the whole commission. I would not send it as just the chair myself. Um, I think I have heard tonight this issue regarding traffic calming budget, and I concur. I don't think there's enough budget to get the work done that we need to get done. Um, Jeff, if you had to take a stab at the 16 projects, 16 residential projects, what budget would you need to solve? I'm not saying you're going to do that all in one year, but how much money do you think we need to solve the projects in front of us? Are we like a million dollars, five million dollars? Where are we at? <laughs> yeah, I really have no idea. Um... So I can, let's see, examples of projects. Boulder Point, I think we are running around 40 or 50,000 for the design and the corresponding four or 500,000 for the improvements. Fremont's is roughly 100,000 in striping. Linda Vista at this point is just radar feedback sensors we've already, so it's like super wide variety. I, I really don't know until we got into them. Um, what that that level would be, as as you know, we recommended fifty thousand as a starting point annually, which is very limited. Um, and then we got direction to push it up some, so we'll do that. But there, I mean, there is real fiscal realities with our funding sources. I, I don't have a good number for you. I really don't know. It's too many and too many unknowns. Okay, Mr. Koenig. Um. I I think the most important thing is adding more people because even if you have more money, if you don't have enough people, you can't spend it on projects. Um, and so that's probably the, the great place to start. Also, I don't know if it makes sense to uh, try and put a big number out there because that tends to scare people. And so I think it's better off just to say, hey, can we have a little more this year and and try and do better next year than we did this year. So you're supportive of the letter as is? I am supportive of the letter as is adding that value for the residential transportation uh, or the, yeah. The 50,000, adding the 50,000 50 to be clear. 50 yep. plus. Yeah, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, being really new, I uh, just have a couple comments to this, um, you know, and really defer to the rest of the group on this letter because I'm sure you all have been working on this for some time in terms of really understanding the programs and projects that you all are, you know, are trying to move forward. Um, I think to your point earlier, being able to address that these positions will also be able to help leverage other funding sources so that, you know, we are capitalizing on the money that we do have in the most effective and efficient way, I think is a, is a great tie um, to, you know, kind of what the intent of the big shift is. I mean, tying, you know, these really you know, transformative opportunities in our community, uh, you know, so looking at it from that from that lens. And then, uh, you know, I asked a question as I was walking in and I just want to make sure it goes on record is that, you know, this really is a year one. And so, you know, to the point of, you know, the financial ask, um, you know, what is then going to be needed is that these individuals hopefully will come back and talk to us and talk to the community about 
what is needed to really operationalize the big shift and the programs and projects in front of us. And that's really where, you know, that that's going to be the next big lift. And I, I just want to go on record that, you know, it's not going unnoticed, um, you know, but the resources to Commissioner Koning's point, the resources need to be there in order for us to actually get to the operationalized piece. Thank you for putting this together. Yeah, I see, uh, by the way, I will say, I see head nods from both commissioners online. I think. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Koenig, go ahead. Um, yeah, and you know, the other idea I think of saying, how much would it take to resolve all 16 of these? Like, this is an ongoing program that we're, you know, uh, almost like Seattle where, you know, you, have a year to do this and then you can't support you can't apply more until there's come and so i i think it's good to be cautious about trying to say let's knock all these out and say you know compared to the other things we have going on with the big shift like what's the appropriate amount of time and energy spending to this compared to these other things uh recognizing the amount of work that the city has to do in other places thank you yeah i appreciate that um uh commissioner Eckhoff. I guess I just wanted to put words to the head nod that I certainly agree. And, you know, obviously with this line item of, you know, ongoing, you know, expenses for traffic calming, I, I mentioned that earlier uh, to be large. And I agree with, you know, the other commissioners who are mentioning, you know, the big splash we want to make with the big shift here um, as well. I think to get that really started, I think putting a number in here um, for just these 16 projects, you know, to not even bring to light, you know, connecting sidewalks, connecting bike lanes. This is, you know, for, um, you know, creating, you know, traffic safety for pedestrians and bicyclists within neighborhoods. And this is, um, I think it was just three neighborhoods that you spitballed, Jeff, and I, I was counting, we were almost at a million, um, you know, for just tra traffic calming activities. And so I think putting a number, uh, a, a big number in here, I agree with you, Commissioner Matza. Um, I think we should, should definitely get something big in there. And the rest of the letter, um, Chair Morley, fantastic job. I think this is great and it really does highlight a lot of the work that's going on and I'm really happy to be learning about it and supporting it going forward. Thank you. So just as a, um, for your information, if you look at the ATMP and all the work that Martin's done, like he has some pretty big numbers in there for all these things that you mentioned. So all those things are already accounted for and planned and in the process. Um, and uh, yeah, the this is just specifically for traffic mitigation for residents who complain about uh, speeding in their neighborhoods. And I think one last comment um, from me is, you know, I appreciate quantifying the 16 that's in play and the, the need to justify, you know, the staff and then also the need to justify the work that needs to be done and appreciate putting, you know, the numbers to it. But, you know, we heard tonight is that, you know, as these items either get discussed or implemented, other neighborhoods will probably come forward and say, you know, we're also having an issue and, you know, this traffic calming could really be a benefit. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of a couple places in town where, you know, it probably also would be beneficial as well. So it will be rolling and evolving um, through this time. So, you know, you know, hopefully we can deal with the backlog, but, you know, the money I think needs to be there because this is not, you know, we're not getting it off the plate and we're done. So that's, uh, that, that's all. All right, I think I'm hearing support for it. Maybe, um, I don't think we're asking for it this year, but giving some sense to the scale of the problem that we're resolving. Um, and maybe next year asking, once we get all these staff hired, next year uh, getting a bunch of these projects done. <laughs> um, so uh, Jeff, I think we can work on the details of how to finalize it and get it out together offline. Does that sound good? It does. We have modified it a little bit since you maybe last saw it. If you didn't make it to the very end, uh, this discussion did also happen at Bicycle Advisory Committee last week and will likely happen again tomorrow at Pedestrian Advisory Committee. So if the commission's comfortable with a little bit of liberty to add those things to the end, that we will we will do that to show that the three groups are, are combined in their support. All right. That's okay. Yeah, thank you. And if the other um, chairs want to add their names to the letter and do it as one, that would be you know, whatever's easiest. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, the next item is citizens petition updates uh, from December 6th City Council. 
Yes, thank you. We had a couple of citizen petitions that were generally related to the Transportation Commission that came forward. I think the current process is 25 signatures. So you get 25 signatures as a citizen, bring it forward to the city clerk, they verify the signatures, and you're on the next city council meeting. So we had two petitions last night. One was to um, revisit Boulder Point traffic calming. And, and so how these work is the, it's at the very end of the meeting last night, staff sometimes has a presentation, sometimes doesn't. I did a quick presentation just so there was background for the council. And it takes three council members to kind of head nod. It's not really an official vote to say, yeah, we'd like to talk about this more. So they agreed last night to talk about Boulder Point traffic calming. Um, so I'll have to work to get that on a work session agenda. I'll keep you all informed. Just the update with Boulder Point is we've hired a designer and they're well on their way. So we'll probably be pausing that design, waiting for this uh, new discussion with the council. That's one. The second petition item was from the same person, at least leading the effort from Boulder Point. And he asked, um, so we, so it was regarding traffic studies and public records data. So the city has a process and we follow Arizona public record law. And it's basically, it doesn't have a time frame attached to it, but it says you'll supply, you know, staff will supply the requested information as quickly as possible or expeditious manner. Um, and that timing will depend on how complex or how many documents, so on and so forth. This gentleman's asked that um, traffic study data that's requested be given to the requesting person within 15 days and it will always be available or given to the requesting party at least seven days before any meetings occur, which is quite a bit longer than our 24 hour meeting notice that we currently do. Um, so we just raised a couple of those issues with council, but council also three members said, yeah, we'd like to talk about this as well. So we'll be getting that on an agenda sometime in the future. Usually these fair items go kind of chronologically and the artistic crosswalks is scheduled for February 28th. So it'll, these two will likely be after that, which is kind of normal business with the holidays and things anyway. So I'll keep you informed in February at our meeting, I'll let you know what those dates are that we've got penciled in. So not a lot of discussion for the commission. I just want to make you aware because Boulder Point is certainly one we've spent a lot of time on in the past. Jeff, sometimes the council refers those back to the commission. Do they usually do that? Would they have done that on the 6th if it was going to come back to us? Or um, would they do that on February 28th? You're right. In the past, they have said this seems like a transportation commission item. Let's send it back. They did not do that last night. They said we'd like to take this. They did. Yeah. So if the commission wanted to provide a recommendation to the council, we could add it to our February 1 agenda to to provide our opinion to council on these items being that we've weighed in several times. We could, we could do, we could put it on the agenda for February. Um, I'll have to think about what that looks like, but yes, we could, we could revisit it before they revisit it. Okay. We can talk on that one too. Thank you for the update on those. Any questions from commission? Um, next item is the next regular meeting. We're scheduled for February 1st in 2023. Um, the potential agenda items are the Boulder Point design update. So it sounds like we might already be talking about it. Um, and then the residential management program that we heard tonight, the adoption of that will carry forward this role of the transportation commissioners and see if we can get to it. Um, and then Jeff, I was gonna ask about the CIP process. I know that is in the role of the Transportation Commission. Thank you. Let, let's do that. Okay. Let's do that in February. It'll be in it'll be in pretty good shape by then um, to present. I think staff inputs are due middle to beginning of January, so that'll be perfect. Great. And then if we have time, maybe this creative budgeting um, or partnership budgeting options that the commission could be looking at that we just discussed. Are there other agenda items? Commissioners are. Um, all right, with that, um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Second. You have to make it first. <laughs> uh, I motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. All right, all those in favor, aye. 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 aye.
Thank you, everyone. Have a great night and really appreciate staff for the agenda. Thank you. Good night. Yep. Have a good one.